Welcome to a very special series presented by GayTalkRadio.org and QueerPublicRadio.com. In this series, Gay Talk Radio and Queer Public Radio will feature the complete audiobook, Invisible Hand, written by Larry K. Mason. Although this audiobook is a fictional account, it could be true. Mr. Mason has designed this concept of a completely new monetary system which would, by itself, catapult the world into a caring, loving environment that we have all dreamed of. To explain his concept, Mr. Mason wrote this book and provides it for free on the Internet. Mr. Mason decided to write this book, Invisible Hand, to explain the new system he proposes which has the ability to change our world as we now know it. With his permission, Gay Talk Radio and Queer Public Radio present this wonderful concept for your listening pleasure and serious consideration. For more information, you may visit Mr. Mason's website at nopom.info. That's N-O-P-O-M-I-N-F-O. Nopom.info. On with the show. Invisible Hand, Prologue From our perspective here in 2028, the time of troubles and its aftermath seems so unnecessary and even in some ways silly. But what is obvious in hindsight is often cloaked in mystery while one is living through it. The people who were responsible for the transition and its myriad consequences were just ordinary people. They had no great insights into what the future would bring. They certainly had no idea at the time how future generations would view them. But if we present the story of one man's reactions to the changes, as well as some historical material, perhaps the gentle reader will come to understand both what happened and why it came as such a surprise to almost everyone. Invisible Hand, Chapter 1, Coming Home, in which our unlikely hero lands squarely in the middle of a culture he hasn't seen in over a decade. We learn the reason why. He meets a cute lady and a not-so-cute computer, and, among other things, learns that however much other things may have changed, he will still have to wait in airports. There it was again, the soft crunch of straw under sandals. He cringed and then wordlessly cursed, preparing himself for another round of the staccato questions, the slaps to the face, ice water dashed into his eyes. And this wasn't even their definition of torture, though it sure as hell worked for him. Then, as he scooted backward along the floor of the small box, leaning against the back wall, as far from his piss-pot as possible, the door creaked open, and a wedge of light fell across the floor of his box, a cleansing light revealing the pathetic result of trying to cover an earthen floor with straw in an environment of extremes. There was a noise, and then a person he hadn't seen before stood profiled in black in front of the light. It was... No, it couldn't be. But it looked like... Bring your seat backs into the upright position and replace your tray tables. The steady drone of the SST-2's wing engines rose an octave as the image of the flight attendant recited the standard landing announcements, just as she would have done years ago, before the supersonic transport 2 series had halved the transatlantic time of its historic prototype. The resulting cacophony of tray tables automatically being raised and clicked into place, briefcase laptops snapping shut, video screens retracting, and the infant in 23C bawling with the change in cabin air pressure, all served to rouse 29A, a rumpled, late middle-aged man who had been sporadically napping since the London-Washington leg began, and was now pulling himself into the moment, refolding his lanky frame into what would pass for a semi-upright position. As usual, the dream disappeared around the corner of his consciousness as he awoke to the engine whines, and he again could not remember who it was standing in the doorway. Outside the window, a crystal-clear view of the Washington Monument slid smoothly by as he tried to push the sleep from his mind and the soreness from his neck muscles. The plane touched down, and he had to start thinking of what he was going to do now that he was home again. He appeared to be in his mid-fifties, assuming reasonable living. 
He was dressed in what one might call business casual, in an open-necked pink Oxford cloth shirt and a medium gray suit. His shoes, though unpolished, were good quality soft black calf leather, not one of the newer chemically derived leathers that never dulled. They were shoes that his Aunt Bessie would have considered sensible, and for the most part the man in them could also fit that description. His graying hair had once been auburn shading to chestnut brown, and the clean-shaven face was framed with a strong chin and broad forehead. And if one looked behind the thin frames of the tortoiseshell sunglasses, looked closely, one might see in his steady brown eyes an unspoken hesitancy. He began the ritual of collecting his belongings while waiting for the wave of motion to reach his row so he could join the other deplaning passengers and get on with his day. For Neil Campbell, however, this was a return to the home he left in 2011, for two years, that had become 17 years. Before the war, before his capture and eventual release, and before his gradual re-entry into what he now hoped he would appreciate more than ever as polite society. But it was and wasn't his home, was and wasn't the USA of his life before, just plain was and wasn't. He had tried his best to prepare for shocks and frustration, but it had to happen in reality. No amount of discussion and Q&A would do it for him. He had been warned to expect to change society, change just how much he was about to find out. Seventeen years before, when he had left for the Middle East, his daughter Brianna had been just eleven years old, so Neil couldn't actually say he now knew her. It was, in retrospect, just one piece of a weird puzzle that included his own divorce, a three-month pity party, and to top it all off, a why-the-hell-not agreeing to the hellish posting to the panoramic zone of the Middle East, serving as a consultant to the parliament that used to be the separate nations of Iraq and Iran. Neil was still surprised when he and the other four members of his educational and economic mission were kidnapped by jihadists, smuggled into Afghanistan, and held for what would become 15 years. Given the international protocols since the Third Global Congress on Terrorist Acts, his country could not bargain for their release, as that would be seen as a, as a successful end to the Lawless Act. Rather, they tried for a time through diplomacy back channels and not-so-covert economic pressures to persuade the kidnappers to return the educators. But, given the tumult in the United States at the time of the kidnapping, there was little time and even less ability to reach halfway around the world to effect the release of political prisoners, especially, it seemed, those on the educator level of the totem pole. Neil had had very little information, and none of it had been first-hand until today. His posting to Afghanistan 17 years ago and his subsequent imprisonment had left him ignorant of everything that was not within sight of the valley in which he had lived as a prisoner. From what he had learned during his 60-plus day rehabilitation process in London prior to his homecoming, his release was fortunate indeed. Damn strange ideas those folks have over there now about money, his handler Darren had told him when he arrived in England. Said it was necessary and all because of the economic mess, you know. I still don't quite think I understand how that new money of theirs is supposed to work, but it does, damn my eyes, it bloody well does. During the two months Neil had been in London, Darren had damned his eyes over everything from food on a given day to the weather, so Neil really didn't have a firm hold on what he was being told. Just be cool and take it easy, had been the refrain. It's still a good old USA. But after all was said and undone to the best of their abilities, it was still just sixty days to make up for fifteen years. A bad trade by anyone's book. Neil was trusting his daughter that there was room in her apartment for him. Having someone to drop in to live with her without more than a couple days' warning would have made his wife crazy. Of course, she wasn't really his wife anymore. That was something else the Middle East war had cost him. Seventeen years in his family. He hoped it was worth it. He tried to explain to his wife that he could hardly come home in the middle of a war... She might have accepted that, but when other men rotated back and he still didn't come, she'd said it was the last straw. But that was 17 years ago. At least the government of the province he had been in was now stable. Okay, now to get through security and customs and find Brianna. Neil checked that he still had his carry-on, his book, and his passport. Yep, that should do it. The huge lobby looked about the same, except for some moving sidewalk things and the overhead tram shuttle bubbles, which Neil thought looked pretty cool. They didn't have those in London, and he wondered what other differences he would find in his old hometown. What he did note was the stylistic proscenium arch structures framing each major entrance into the airport proper. He knew these to be the latest in scanning technology, capable of accuracy far better than the standard to the primitive devices of the late 20th century. 
As Neil followed a young woman with a tight rhythmic bottom in a navy business suit, he noticed as they approached that the customs section looked pretty much the way he remembered it. The swaying suit stopped so suddenly that he narrowly averted an embarrassing introduction, but he managed it as they formed the end of the line of their fellow passengers from flight TA-636 into the returning citizen queue. Neil cleared his throat and, looking past the blonde hair in front of him, said, Excuse me, but is there a separate line for customs, or do we stay in this one? The suit pivoted to show a better-than-average-looking woman in her twenties, wearing a ruffled white silk blouse, confirming his conclusion about the business suit. This is one, and, I th and then they move us into another somewhere, I think. I've never been to this one before, she responded, only slightly looking at him, more or less at a space above and a half inch to her right of his left ear. Well, I declare, he said, hoping the corny joke might crack the ice that was quickly surrounding them in the climate control terminal. Uh, the woman managed to get out through her obvious indifference to him. You know, customs? Well, I declare, it's an expression, he continued the laugh dissolving as suddenly as he wished he could. Get back in with people, they had drilled into him from the first day he had arrived at the London Center. You've got a lot to relearn, just being around people, for starters. Hell, man, you've barely heard any English for a dozen years and seen nobody from home in at least that long. You'll have to relearn a lot of things, but the most important is your social intercourse. They really said that. Neil imagined the USA he had left, where someone looks at another person, a virtual stranger, and suggests some social intercourse. There'll always be in England. Oh, customs, she slowly repeated. Customs. As if she had been any colder, she would have been on a slab in the morgue. And the look that came with it told Neil that he was about one half-assed comment away from... From what, he wondered. Looking around, he saw only the usual sleepy guards hanging around the scanning area, but then decided that this venture in back ends to socializing had reached its end. Thanks, he said and instantly wondered why in the hell he'd said that. But when he looked up, she was gone, through the scans and walking in perfect 2-4 time to the women's lounge, no doubt to describe the creep she had just met online to whomever might listen. He got to the customs desk, and they had him run his carry-on through the machine. The woman behind the counter was an attractive brunette, though, to be honest, they were all attractive to him, as they would be to any sighted individual after burkas and yaks. She wore a tailored burgundy wool suit, fitting in all the right places, as Luellis Archer might say, a patch with an unfamiliar logo, some type of crossed parabolas in red and yellow, and a metallic nameplate reading, Arden, how may I assist you? Over her heart finished the ensemble. I've only got one bottle of scotch, Neil said as he put his carry-on on the counter between them. That's fine, sir, I'm sure, said Arden, but would you please step over on this mat? There was a spongy-looking greenish mat about three feet square off to his right, and Neil got behind the man who had preceded him through the scanner, someone he remembered as walking up and down the aisle during much of the time Neil had not been napping on the plane. "'What's that for, uh, Arden?' Neil asked, bloodied but unbowed from his recent feeble flirtation. She actually was attractive once the second look got you past the institutional anonymity of these costumes inspire. "'The mat?' she began. "'Yes, what does it do? I mean, didn't the scanner—' It doesn't get everything, she said, finishing the sentence. With this, we can scan for various contagious materials and chemical substances not allowed in this country, she told him, adding, and not detectable by magnetic image. With a look that as much as said, which rock have you been living under? Had he noticed, she might have been surprised that he could have told her just which rock he had literally been living under, or in, if you count a cave as a big rock, or how he was unaccustomed to being here. Ha ha, he thought to himself. You're a riot, Campbell, a regular laugh riot, as his old TV buddy Ralph Cramden would have said. With Neil standing on the mat, Arden ran what looked like a vintage vacuum cleaner attachment around his waist and looked at a display screen off to her right. That's fine, sir. Welcome to Washington, she said, peremptorily resheathing the wand in a slot in the counter beside her. As he moved from the mat to make room for the woman behind him, he couldn't place her from the plane. Neil asked Arden, The scotch? How much do I owe? There's no duty, sir, she responded, smiling in a sincere way, even as she looked slightly past him to the next person. Thanks, he said. Realizing he had nothing but a fat roll of euro currency in his pocket, he added, Could you tell me where I can change some money? Change some money, sir? she queried. Yes, I have some euros I'd like to convert to dollars. I need pocket money to get around in town. I'm afraid I don't have a penny of American money on me. You don't have an account, sir? Her eyebrows rising. His answer had, for one reason or another, arrested her attention enough for her to look from the woman behind him and back to Neil, settling on him. Hmm, what was that look for? An account, he said. What kind of account? 
Look, I've been uh, away for some time, and I don't know from bank numbers. He responded with more swagger than he felt. Why was she asking about accounts? He wondered how this had slipped by his re-intel team. Or maybe he should have read that brochure on the new money they had given him. He thought back through his memory. Finances. Brianna has power of attorney, and that's all with her. So just what is this? For the first time since leaving what had become his comfortable surroundings outside London, Neil had the fleeting discomfort of not knowing. Not knowing about this account business. Not knowing about the lack of duty on scotch. No currency exchange. What else? He was sure that he was looking, as well as feeling, on edge, so he glanced up at the nearest arrival departure monitor, hoping to catch his breath. A little time, and maybe a clue. Before he pulled his eyes back to the person, he noticed that whatever those things up there were, they weren't arrival departure monitors. If he had been within ten feet of a restroom, he would have gone in for a much-needed splash in the face. No such luck. All he could come up with was Darren's all-purpose admonition, and he played it for what he hoped would be cool. Why, uh, are you with the bank? He added with what he thought was a wink-wink tone, if a vocal tone could have a physical characteristic. No, no, sir, you don't understand, she said, her broad smile barely concealing a laugh that came through anyway in her voice. Neil had the sudden sensation that he was the diversion of the hour, a bobble-headed doll with a goofy face. Money is always in an account. You have to have an account to have money, sir. There is no other way. Oh, he said, relieved that he understood, even though, on second thought, he wouldn't give three to five that he did. What kind of account? I really don't want to convert much. A thousand euros or so. No sooner had Neil said this than he wondered why he had added that bit about the amount of money. Years of cells and locked rooms with nothing but a straw pallet on a stone or earthen floor and a pot tended to make one non-communicative. She, Arden, wasn't the enemy. But, hey, habits are habits. Maybe he was assimilating faster than he thought. They had told him the drugs they had given him would stop the unreasoning fears and sudden anger and persistent paranoia after a time, in addition to blocking most of the memories better forgotten. He was no longer waking up in a panic every night, just some nights. He no longer hoarded food he didn't need. Perhaps they knew what they were talking about. Must send Darren a message of congratulations for his cerebral douches, as he had called them, to the disdain of the men and women who had worked so hard to make the drugs work for him, easing his transition. But they understood. He was a corny jokester, and it was a good sign that he cared enough to joke about stuff like that. I'm sorry, Arden was continuing. I didn't make myself clear, uh, Mr. She looked down at her manifest display. Campbell, come on, Neil, he said. Uh, TA-636 from London, that would be? Ah, uh, yes, I see. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, Arden continued in a sweet, clear voice. As I was saying, I don't think you understood what I meant just now by your account. Saying this, she caught the eye of a gray-suited fellow team member and inclined her head slightly in the universal, Come on over. Susan, would you help me out here for a moment while I assist this gentleman? Sure, said Susan, who would never see the day when she challenged Arden in the looks department, Neil thought to himself. Account is not what I meant, Arden was finishing as Neil rejoined her from his reverie. I'm sorry, he said, brushing his hair back from his forehead with his left hand before continuing. Didn't catch all of that. He sure wasn't making it easier for her to help him, and the hell of it was that he liked her, and not just as the first attractive woman to take anything near and interest in him in the past, well, years. Good God, he was glad he hadn't thought over much along those lines, the ease of depression being what it was. He jerked back to reality before he lost track again and made himself look even dumber than he must look at this moment. He smiled and nodded. That's okay, she was continuing. The account I'm talking about is different from what you referred to. It's not a bank account, I mean. I was talking about your money account, your luxury account. She glanced at him, half fearing he would return an expression registering zero comprehension. She wasn't disappointed. Please step this way for a moment. I have quite a lot of money, he said, following her. I got my severance pay in euros just last week. Uh, that won't do you much good here, she said. Not many people will accept it outside the airport. If you want to spend money, it'll be a lot easier if you put it in your account. Okay, he said, grinning. Where do I sign? Oh, you don't have to sign anything. She turned into a small, rather austere room with a TV screen on one wall. Just step over here to the ID station, and we will get you set in a jiffy. She turned to her left and pointed to what looked like an eye examination device from an optometrist's office sitting on a small table with what looked sort of like a coffee maker's hot plate below the TV screen. There was no chair to sit in, so Neil walked in the direction she pointed, but was looking at her rather than the blank TV. First tell the computer that you want an account. I want an account, Neil said to the eye machine. What is your full name? the TV asked. Neil only twitched a little to the TV and said, N.D. Campbell. I need to have your full name, not just initials, the still-darkened TV said. 
I'll be looking over your records, and it will be easier and quicker if I have your full name. When I address you in public, I use whatever name you like. He noticed that Arden had left the room. Oh, well. All right. My name, my full name, is Neil David Campbell. I was born in Minot, North Dakota, in 1970, January 6th. Is that Neil spelled with an I-A? The TV asked. Yes, it is. Will that do? Neil replied, beginning to wonder what he was getting into. Oh, yes, that does quite nicely. Then you do want to be your previous self and don't want to adopt a new identity, it said. Why would I want to be anyone other than myself, he asked incredulously. What kind of runaround are you giving me? Neil was getting a little angry. The TV wasn't acting like any bank official he had ever dealt with. In fact, it was treating him like he was opening a secret numbered account in Switzerland or something. I am giving you your freedom, sir, it said. You are free to have whatever name you like and present yourself as anyone you like. But you must be known to me for your account to work. I must be able to identify you from among almost 400 million people. I must know you regardless of your name or your appearance. I must be able to positively identify you or you won't be able to use the account. Also, once you begin using the account, you won't be able to adopt a different identity with a different account. You get only the one account. Who are you really, Neil said, beginning to feel like the victim in some candid camera stunt. I am the computer that keeps track of the money accounts and other things. Other things? Certainly. I keep track of where you are and what you own, as well as everything connected with the money you earn. Wait, Neil said. What kind of account is this? Is it a savings account, a checking account, a certificate of deposit? It's just an account, sir. There's only one kind of account. It's the record of all the money you have and how you earned it. A still blank, blank screen stood. But what about this currency I have, he asked. That is not money to me, sir. That's just paper and metal disks. Money exists only in these accounts, sir, though you may be able to trade that currency for money if you like. Once we set up your account, I can ask someone from the traders to accept your paper and coins. He could almost hear the italics when he said the word currency. Wait a minute, he protested. What if I don't want to convert these euros into your money? That's your choice, sir. They are your property. You can always say, I won't, it said. Damn right I can. I can say a lot more than that. If you wish, sir. Now, if you would just look through the eyepiece for a few seconds, sir. What the hell for, he almost shouted. He was really beginning to get mad. He could feel the all-too-familiar reactions to his anxiety and paranoia kicking in. Sir, I already know your voice, your face, your body shape, your manner of movement. Now I need to get your retina patterns, your handprints, and your smell. My smell? What kind of crazy setup is this, anyway? Are you insane? He must have been a little crazy himself to say that to a computer, but he wasn't at his best, what with the jet lag and the changes he'd been through in the last two months. Sir, you don't want to limit yourself to only one form of identification, do you? Besides, this will make any large purchases you make much easier and quicker. It will be exceedingly difficult for anyone to present themselves as you with all these forms of identification. It was trying to sound persuasive and comforting. He had to admit that the technicians who programmed that thing were damned good. It also means that no matter where I go, you can pick me out of a crowd. Everywhere you have a sensor or a camera, you'll be able to know it's me. You'll know everything I do. That's quite true, sir. But then, that's true whether you have an account or not. Neil felt a chill, and the hairs on the back of his neck began to stand up. He'd read too much science fiction as a kid not to recognize a technological big brother when he came face to face with one. And not to mention, thank you very much, that he had just ended over a decade of having his every move watched. Jeez. What could he do now? His daughter and his grandchildren were in this hellish situation. Perhaps he could get them out. He didn't really want to take them back to Europe because the depression there was getting pretty bad. And he could hardly expect them to live in a Muslim country as outsiders. He really didn't know of any place else. Maybe they could escape to Canada. Sir? Sir? It said somewhat worriedly. Are you all right, sir? He came partway out of his near panic and looked reflexively around, as if he'd been caught in a communion line with his fly open. Yeah, yeah, he said, I'm just peachy. I think I'll just convert half my euros. Oh, that's none of my business, the computer said. You can take that up with the trader. Now, if you'll just place each hand on this plate. He felt a sudden draft of air over each hand as it rested for a moment on the hot plate. There was a knock at the door, and Arden opened the door a crack and said, Should I bring the trader in now? I'm done, said the TV. Yeah, it's okay, Neil said. She opened the door the rest of the way, beckoned, and two guys came into the room. One was dressed in a really sharp suit. He had a gold-colored band on his left wrist, and of all things, a flower in his lapel. 
The other guy was older and dressed in a plain off-white suit with no tie, plain black shoes, and a thin turtleneck sweater under the coat. The sharp-dressed guy introduced himself. I am Norman Salvatore, and I have over $120,000. Then he turned to the computer and said, Please verify. The computer said, He is Norman Salvatore, and he does have over $120,000 in his account. Neil about dropped his teeth on the floor. That stupid computer had told him how much money Norman had. Norman didn't turn a hair. He just asked Neil how many euros he had to convert. Did you know that the computer was going to tell me how much money you had in your account? Neil asked as he counted out about half of his roll of bills. Sure, Norman said. How else could you be sure you could trust me? You just arrived in the country and probably don't know who to trust yet. This way you know I'll get you all the money possible for your currency. When Neil stopped counting out bills and started to put the rest away, Norman said, Is that all? What about the rest? Those euros are really going to drop in value if the government over there goes ahead with its stimulus plans. You'll really do better to convert it all. If you go back to Europe, you can always buy more euros. No, I'll just convert this. I think I can get by with that much in my account. Hell, you can get by with nothing in your account, but who wants to live like a payer when you don't have to? Then he glanced at the other man and said, uh, Nothing personal. The other guy gave a little wave and said, It's okay, I don't mind. Norman, having counted the money for himself and riffled the bills in front of the TV screen, said, I have accepted from N.D. Campbell 4,200 euros. Then he looked at Neil and said, How soon do you want to start getting paid? Getting paid, Neil said. Getting paid for giving him the euros, the other man, presumably a payer, said. What else? I want it right now. When the hell did you think I wanted it? Cool down, Norman said. Some people want to get more for their currency and are willing to wait. It doesn't matter to him which way you want it. Then, looking at Neil, he said to, into his carnation, Jeb, I got 4,200 euros. Do we have an outbound that can use it? After a pause, he said, Okay, I'll be there in a minute. Okay, fellow, if Herbie here is on the ball, you should have your pay in about ten minutes. What pay? I'm converting these euros to dollars, he said. Herbie, the payer guy, said, I pay you for providing the euros that Norman will sell to someone who wants euros. That benefits whomever that is, and therefore I pay you. You will pay me now? I'll pay you in a few minutes if what Jed says is true. Herbie said, turning away and starting for the door following Norman. Well, somebody had better pay me, and damn soon I'm coming with you. You aren't getting out of my sight until I'm paid. And Neil hustled to catch up with Herbie. Neither guy looked like much of an athlete. Herbie especially looked like he was about 65, and Norman was rather thin, as the slick suit made clear, and only about five foot six. so Neil figured if he, they tried something, he could always just take his money back. But they only went about 50 feet and turned into another office, where there was a woman dithering at the counter while the man behind the counter made soothing noises. The euros are right here, Jeb, Norman said, and the woman turned with an expression of vast relief. Oh, thank goodness, she sighed. Norman counted them out on the counter on a built-in scanner and said, What's your name, ma'am? To the woman. Millicent Marie Schwartz, she said firmly. Millicent Marie Schwartz, I have here 4,200 euros in currency. Do you wish to buy this currency at a price of $3,623.40? Recited Norman. Yes, I do, said Millicent. Millicent, you now own the currency which has been scanned in the amount of 4,200 euros. I have deducted $3,623.40 from your account, said the computer in the same voice he had heard in the other room. Do you really think only 9,500 euros will be enough? Millicent asked Jeb. Ma'am, they should be plenty, and you can always buy more at the airport or any American embassy. But I can't trust those people. They might steal my money. Ma'am, you can deposit it in a bank right there at the airport and carry a card that will let you pay for things from that bank account, very much like you do here. But they might steal the card. Ma'am, they require identification before they accept the card. You'll be just fine. If all our tourists were robbed when they got to London, you'd have heard of it now on the news. That would be a very valuable thing to know, wouldn't it? Norman contributed, You just watch what the other tourists and business travelers do. Most of them are old hands at this. They wouldn't keep going back there if there were anything to worry about, now would they? Reassured, Millicent went on her way. While this exchange had been going on, the payer had been talking to a small box about the size of a cigarette package in a quiet voice. He motioned Neil over. Are you N.D. Campbell, who gave 4,200 euros to Norman Salvatore? He said in a formal tone of voice, holding the box between himself and Neil. Well, who the hell do you think I am? I haven't left your side since I gave Norman that money. Sir, this is for the computer. It likes to verify everything to be sure that the right person is getting credit. I have to testify that I knew you in order to credit your account without your affirmation on the record. 
Oh, okay. I am N.D. Campbell, and I gave 4,200 euros to Norman Salvatore. The computer spoke up. Mr. Campbell, you now have $84,503.28 in your account. I have what? It just sort of burst out of him. You have $84,503.28 in your account, the machine obligingly repeated. Where did that come from, he said. Some of your assets were in stocks and bank accounts. At the transition, you had some insurance policies. Also, since the divorce took place after the transition, you were credited with half the pay of the, for the equity you had in your house when your wife turned it in. You've been getting about $150 per month since then. The computer seemed to be enjoying itself. How did they program personality into a computer? You mean that I'm getting rent on a house I don't own anymore? I thought that went to my wife in the settlement, Neil said. The settlement which you signed, if you don't remember it now, was just a statement of what was to be done with the assets you own jointly. Actually, he had never read the thing. He was so bummed out that he didn't care anymore. That was only part of why he hadn't tried harder to come home before he'd been kidnapped. So he had just signed the papers on the lines with a little X and sent them back. So if I already had all that money, why did you say I didn't have an account? Uh, sir, you didn't have an account until you requested an account. No one is required to have an account. You don't have to use money unless you want to. It's your choice. But just because you don't have an account doesn't mean that we forget what you've done for others. Once I confirmed your identity, I was able to use the records of payments to your credit to calculate how much you'd been paid over the years. What if I had never come back? He asked. Then the records would eventually have been archived and no one could have spent the money, the machine said. What if someone else had claimed to be N.D. Campbell and asked for an account? First, I would have checked their personal characteristics, as I did with you. Then I would have searched the records for someone else with those characteristics. Since each person is unique, I could have rejected the claim if I found another account for a person with those characteristics. The last part seemed to be parenthetical, scripted, Neil thought, before he was able to catch it. The whole damn thing is scripted, he reflected, or at least a huge part must be. The still blank TV was continuing, no indication that it was even on except the voice that issued from it. Neil found it creepy and disconcerting. Then I would have tried to get other indications of identity. In your case, there are DNA records for your wife and daughter, and with those I could have demonstrated conclusively that the imposter could not be you. In an extreme case, I would have asked for the cooperation of people who knew the real N.D. Camel before you left the country. I would have requested that they assist me to identify you. Their memories of you with confirmation from records about your activities would make it quite difficult for an imposter. There are some other ways in which I can use, but I'd rather not go into them now. Another thing, Neil said with just an edge and in the tone of aggressiveness. What are you doing telling everyone how much money I have in my account? Oh, they couldn't understand that part of what I said. It was sort of a mumble to them, like this. Neil heard a mumble of what sounded like speech, but it refused to resolve into understandable words. But Herbie laughed aloud. I just told Mr. Severbach a new joke that's going around, but I focused the sound so that only he could understand the words. That way I can talk to you without others being able to understand. It's quite a useful facility. Neil had also been warned during reacculturation that the society had taken leaps of great magnitude toward a computer control of essential factors, the economic charting and bookkeeping not excluded. As they flew over Newfoundland, he had begun to get the feeling that he had always had around computers for as long as he could remember. Wonderful adding machines and fast organizers, but a threat if we're not careful. He was only a casual reader of science fiction, but of those he had read so long ago, the ones with dark, gloomy prophecies stuck with him the most. Sort of a cyber Frankenstein type of thing. The best example came from near the middle of the last century in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, where the computer controlling the spaceship actually has a personality, goes nuts, and becomes a rogue operative, willing to do anything to avoid its personal destruction, just like a human being. Sort of. Neil thought for a moment and couldn't, and couldn't remember if the computer in the movie, how, had a real personality, but that hardly mattered now, 50 years later. This invisible wonder speaking through the TV probably has more personality than Arden's co-worker, he thought, with less charity than he would have liked. But what were its motives? He just had to watch it. His overly fertile imagination, along with the paranoia he had acquired over the last 15 years and his predilection to think the worst of computers if he thought of them at all, was a dangerous combination in what this country apparently had become. He might start thinking a computer was out to get him. He reflected with some hope that he actually had not even left the airport yet, so this might be just a weird exception. But even as he formed the thought in his mind, he was doubting it. It was in this fog of uncertainty that Neil said goodbye to Norman, Herbie, and Jeb, and went to retrieve his luggage. 
It was waiting for him in the baggage claim area, in a small pile under a sign with his name flashing on it. As he bent to pick it up, a boy of about ten ran up and said peremptorily, "'What's your name, sir?' Caught a bit off guard by the hedged, less-than-friendly greeting, Neil shot back, "'What's it to you, kid?' "'These bags belong to N.D. Campbell,' he said, separating Neil's last name into two words. "'And if you are not N.D. Campbell, you can't have them.' "'Well, good for you,' Neil said, reaching for the larger bag, a leather job that had seen its best days many years previous. He got his second surprise in as many minutes as the kid leaned in and sort of thrust himself between Neil and the bag, not assaulting him or grabbing the bag, just making the three of them look like a bizarre pieta or two contestants interrupted in the middle of Twister, a drinking game from Neil's college days. "'Well, are you Camp Bell or not?' the kid persisted, his head turned almost ninety degrees." Neil could see that he had a trace of something brown at the far corner of his mouth. Peanut butter? He was not the waif that would run up to carry your bags for bakshish. He was dressed modestly in clean blue jeans. Neil knew before he had even left the country way back when that he had marked himself as an archaic by continuing the modifier blue before jeans. He had a thin sort of zip jacket, an off-red deal with a small hood, underneath which he had on a yellow shirt and it with a button-down collar. Neil noticed that more quickly than he would have otherwise had he not been in England, and noticed their sartorial preference for widespread English collars. No buttons, of course. For a kid who was nearly five feet tall and all of a hundred pounds, he was one hell of an obstacle to the current mission. It's pronounced Campbell, kid, he said. You don't pronounce the P because it's silent. Well, are you Campbell or not? The youth persisted. I am Campbell, and these are my bags, if it's any business of yours. Wordlessly, the kid pointed at the sign where his name had been flashing, and it was saying, Identity confirmed. Relaxing against the counter, the kid said, They are your bags, sir, and you are not taking someone else's bags by mistake. If you'd been picking up the wrong bags, I could have gotten paid for preventing the error, so you see, sir, it is a business of mine. Damn smart-mouthed kid, Neil thought. I just hate it when they show me up that way. It takes all the fun out of being a grouchy old man. But Neil noted that the jacket, though in good shape, might have been a hand-me-down as it hung a bit loosely on the kid's shoulders when he stood straight upright. Almost like a second wave, the sense of the kid's response washed over him. Maybe the kid really needed the money. Neil started to pick up his bags before moving toward the exit, and the kid pipes up again. May I help you carry your bags, sir? Now that he had his bags, he relaxed. He surprised himself at how clutchy and possessive he had been about things since his return to the real world, but that, too, was supposed to mitigate as he re-entered his old world. Or what's left of it, he mused, thinking of the computer. You really do this as a business? Sure. Lots of people are strangers here and don't know their way around. I get paid to help them. Then you can help me. What do you think you can carry? Oh, I can carry that big bag, sir, I think. So Neil handed him the big bag, and the boy struggled a little, but managed to carry the bag all the way out to the line of taxicabs waiting at the curb. Okay, kid, I guess you earned your tip. Do you take euros? Euros, sir? What would I want with euros, he said. Well, I'm sorry, Neil began, trying not to sound as defensive as he felt, but that's the only money I have on me just now. Damn, he reflected, is everything complicated now? You know, bakshish, he said. You're going to give me something? He said, rather surprised. What for? For carrying my bag. Why did you think? Neil looked more closely at the kid. He had looked normal before, but maybe there was something in his eyes or, or something. No, he had nice brown eyes, didn't walk like he was wired on anything, no shudders, twitches, or twinges. Still an odd damn question, Neil thought. Well, there's a pair right over there. I was expecting him to pay me, the boy said, pointing. There was another of those old guys in a white outfit, wearing a cool weather jacket, sitting on a bench, watching them with a grin on his face. He pays you? What for? Because I'm helping you, of course. Don't you know anything? Then he clapped his hand over his mouth and blushed and said, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to insult you. It's just that everybody knows that payers will pay you if you do something good for someone else. You kind of startled me, sir. Neil laughed for the first time in several days and said, Well, kid, I guess I really don't know as much as I should, so I guess you only told the truth. Can you also get paid for helping me get a cab? I guess so, sir, but it's really very easy. All you do is get in and tell the driver where you want to go. What if I don't know where it is I want to go? If you just got here, perhaps you'd like to go to a hotel? The boy said after a minute. There are lots of hotels. You can see a listing of them over there, he said, pointing to a kiosk with several display screens. When they had passed it before, Neil had assumed that they were arrival departure monitors. Second time for that mistake, but damn it, they had to have those things somewhere. I really want to go to my daughter's house. Can you help me find where that is? 
Sure, just tell a computer who you are and who your daughter is, and it will tell you where she is, he said confidently. Don't you mean it will tell me where she lives? No, sir, it can tell me where my mother is whenever I ask, because it knows where her phone is. Since she always has the phone, it knows where she is. I guess I should phone my daughter to tell her I arrived safely. Can I do that somewhere around here? Don't you have a phone, sir? he asked, surprised. No, son, I just got here from a long way away where almost nobody has a phone. How do they talk to their friends when they want to? Well, usually they just holler and their friends are close enough to hear them. But anyway, let's go try that kiosk phone. So the boy escorted Neil over to the kiosk. There were several of those TV screens separated by short partitions. The boy gestured for Neil to stand in front of one of the screens and said, Tell the computer your name and who you want to talk to. I am N.D. Campbell and I want to talk to Brianna P. Miller. The machine came back with, Which Brianna P. Miller, sir? The kid stuck in. She's his daughter, the computer said. One moment, please. In about ten seconds, Brianna's image, or at least it looked like Neil remembered her looking from when he had last phoned her, was looking back at him from the screen. Her face was narrow, hair shoulder length and dark brown with sun-bleached streaks. Her brown eyes framed by nicely arched brows, and the nose looked a little sunburned as well. His daughter had grown up quite nicely, he thought. Hello. Hello, Brianna. Who is this? she asked. The computer answered for Neil. He's your father. Dad, why didn't you tell me you were coming in today? We would have met you at the airport. Well, Brianna, I didn't want to put you to all that trouble. Oh, pooh. It would have been a wonderful excursion for the kids. They'd never been to the airport. They'd love to see the planes take off and land. Anyway, I'm here now and about to take a cab. What address should I give the driver? Just tell him you want to go to your daughter's house. He'll find it. He doesn't know me or you. How in the world will he be able to find your house? Well, you have to pay for a cab, and the computer will know who you are and who your daughter is, and it'll tell him. And then, with her voice dropping an octave, she added with the slightest concern, Goodness, Dad, isn't it obvious? I mean, you're kidding, right? Hardly in the country for an hour, and already two smart-mouthed kids were giving him a hard time. But at least this time it was Brianna, so it was easy to take. As if reminded, Neil looked down, and sure enough, the five-foot gadfly was still there, looking up and no doubt listening. Okay, honey. Yeah, I guess I'm kidding. Just the flight and all. I'm, I'm kind of all in. Look, I'll see you as soon as I can get there, okay? Sure, Dad, she responded. And Dad? Yes, honey? It's really great to hear your voice. I can't wait to see you. Some weird lump appeared in Neil's throat as Brianna said this, and he could hardly get out. I can't either. Love you, sweet pea, he said, his childhood nickname for her springing out of nowhere. Me too. Bye. And she rang off. Neil shook hands with the boy, said goodbye and thanks. The boy was all smiles. Neil thought he must have been thinking about how much money he would get for helping that poor old man who didn't know the most obvious things. The boy was running toward the payer even before Neil got the bags into the taxi. He suddenly wondered why it never occurred to him to ask the boy what he was doing all alone at the airport. Then Neil thought, he probably would have asked me what I was doing all alone at the airport since I was the one who didn't know it to how to do anything. Smart mouth kid. The cabbie seemed to think Neil knew what to do, so Neil tried to maintain the illusion. I'm Indy Campbell, and I want to go to my daughter's house, Neil said. After a brief pause, the cabbie said, That will be $14.22. Neil said, Okay. Since he was getting used to the computer screens being everywhere, it was no surprise to see a screen on the dash of the cab with a route laid out and the price at the top of the screen. The cab pulled away from the curb and into traffic. They'd gone almost halfway to Brianna's house when he realized that there were no potholes. It isn't something that he would have normally paid attention to when he lived there, but he had just returned from a place where paving, even with potholes, is considered a modern wonder. Once he noticed how smooth the ride was, he remembered how there had always seemed to be potholes every now and then. By the time he was almost there, he couldn't stifle his curiosity any further. Say, friend, last time I was here there were potholes. How come I don't see any on this trip? Do they keep them all in some other part of town now? He said, using his best comedic delivery. Potholes? Man, it's been years since we had many potholes. If they made the road so they got potholes easily, it would cut their pay quite a bit. Every time somebody fixed a pothole in a road they'd made, that other person would start getting some of the pay they would otherwise, that would otherwise have gone to the original builder. And that's not even counting the penalty for loss of use while the potholes were fixed. You wouldn't believe how careful they are now. Well, at least something was better. Of course, they said the trains ran on time for Hitler, so it didn't mean that much to Neil. His thoughts were rather grim as he got out of the cab and reached futilely for the tip that the cabbie didn't wait for and he couldn't give anyway. Why did they have to mess up the money, he growled to himself. 
Invisible Hand, Chapter 2, Clark's Joke, in which we meet Clark Minton and see the origins of his practical joke, some joke. We also join a floundering political campaign and see it take a desperate gamble. South Florida, Tuesday, August 3rd, 2010. Since the election was only three months away, and since all the other salaried campaign staff were busy tying up the phones, arranging job interviews, and calling friends of friends, Clark Halsip Minton spent most hours of most days surfing the Internet. One of his most enjoyable things was to think up a word and type it into I Know, the powerful search engine that looked at over five billion websites, according to a sign on their site, that reminded Clark of the McDonald's over 23 billion served on all the lighted message boards under the arches. His increasing solitude in the office, largely self-imposed, was in large part a result of his four years at Vanderbilt, where, miracle of miracles, he found that it was not a mortal sin to be smart or interested in becoming that way. Growing up in the shadow of that graduate of the School of Hard Knocks, Buddy Minton himself, Clark had found little paternal support for his consuming interest in reading. Hell's bells, son, his daddy was fond of saying. Ain't nobody paid to read books, and damn few are paid to squat to write them. So what you need, son, is to get out in the real world. Do you think I got all this? He would say, melodramatically sweeping his hand in a proprietary arc, regardless of whether he was in their palatial house or the Dairy Queen. From reading books? You bet your sweet Aunt Bessie I didn't. Clark, then, grew up with only his mother's support for his basic independence, including the practice of reading in relative safety. Over the years, it was safe to say that while she enjoyed and appreciated the bounty that Sawyer brought to Minton clan, she grew to resent constantly languishing in the shadow of Big Buddy and being treated lovingly but firmly as good for just three things, only two of which could be mentioned in polite society. So far as she was able, she encouraged Clark to arm himself with the wits and other tools he would need come the day he no longer could stay within the program, as Buddy was fond of saying. So, despite despairing and disparaging comments from his father, and the winking of his rural macho classmates, Clark gradually dropped even the pretext of interest in chugging Colt 45's 40s, the 40-ounce bottle of that popular malt liquor, and then engaging in such hayseed Olympic activities as drag racing, whoring, and other worthwhile shenanigans on a Saturday night. When the time came to apply to colleges, Clark was pleasantly surprised to learn that he had actually made it into Vanderbilt on his own merit, even as Buddy stood by, checkbook in hand, to endow, if necessary, his son's place in the class of 2010. The ugly duckling of Smoot County, Georgia, soon turned into a swan as Clark warmed instantly to the intellectual atmosphere and ambience of the Nashville campus. When, it, with his visits home increasingly rare, Buddy always trying to talk him out of his honors humanities major and into something worthwhile like anything to help make money, Clark Minton grew into quite an interesting, well-educated gentleman, which is to say someone so opposite his dad that people could be excused for thinking Clark was adopted. In the few months he had been back in the family home, largely at the request of his mother, who missed his conversation and geniality, Clark had been considering whether or not graduate school might be the thing after all. His problem, actually, was not so much one of identifying his interests as discovering an outlet for them that wouldn't send Buddy around the bend. It wasn't a case of worrying about his inheritance, there was already a sizable trust fund awaiting his 25th birthday, but rather thinking of his mother, who would bear the brunt of Buddy's dissatisfaction if Clark were to do some damn fool thing with his life. And of all the things he didn't want, it was to be the source of his mom's unhappiness. Which is why, a couple of weeks after graduation, he dutifully accepted the job with Frobisher for Congress re-election campaign that Buddy had so kindly volunteered him for. So one day, Clark types in money, since he was thinking of calling Buddy in a few minutes, and the list of first 100 of 167,579,034 had one site called Physical Object Money, Why Things Go Wrong. Thinking he might get some ammunition to use in his next grilling from Buddy about making something with your damn life, Clark decided to kill a few minutes and click through up to the website. Meanwhile, at about the time Clark was visiting the website, his father was sitting down to lunch, generally a happy time of day for him. But today he couldn't seem to dive in as he usually did, and the reason was simple enough. He was worrying about his son again, for about the four millionth time. But he always got steamed thinking about Clark, and how if he, Buddy Minton, had worked his way through Valdosta State and owned 10,000 acres by his 30th birthday, well, hell, it just can't be that the boy was his. But they looked as much alike as two peas in a pod, except that Clark's punch was smaller. So he had to secretly blame Lozelle, his wife, and Clark's mama, for whatever it was that made Clark Clark, and not like him, Buddy. God, he thought, what if they had named him Buddy Jr.? 
But Lizelle loved her son. Every highfalutin pound of his lazy ass, and Buddy had to grin and bear it, being satisfied to growl to himself between forks of barbecue washed down with sweet tea, a sort of a grunt with each recollection of Clark's latest damn fool stuff and such. And now that Frobisher seemed certain to lose, can't the son of a bitch do anything right? That meant that the kid would be back in his life, mooning around the house, reading poetry with that stupid expression on his face, asking for money to spend on God knows what. But it sure wasn't a ticket out of Daddy's life. You can damn sure bet on that. At this last thought, Buddy made a half-growl, half-snort that caught the attention of diners at the trestle table to his left. He quietly picked the pieces of barbecue and coleslaw from his sleeve in the front of his shirt, sloshed some sweet tea, and pulled his bowl of vanilla pudding in front of him, muttering under his breath. South Florida... Friday, August 6th, 2005. Look, folks, I mean, God dang it, folks, we've got to come up with something, yelled Huey Ormond. Congressman Frobisher's trusted right-hand man and campaign manager, he was desperate and as serious as a man can be who was looking unemployment and the end of the gravy train straight in the eye. He was begging, pleading for his staff to come up with something, anything that would turn the tide for their candidate. I don't have to remind you, he said, intoning as a boy raised on tent revivals can, that we are getting a serious butt-kicking courtesy of a woman, D.A., of all things. All she's been doing the last ten years is putting people in prison, so now everybody says, Oh, the Ann Constable is the way to go. She's tough on crime. Here the economy's falling apart. People can't afford gas to come down to vacation here anymore, and we're letting her get away with a tough on crime campaign. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You've been eating our food, using our phones, and trying to get dates with the local talent. Now go eat fish, stand on your heads, rub a banana, or do whatever it is that makes you smart, and come up with something to turn this thing around. As he finished this speech, he punctuated his sincerity with a well-timed thump of his fist on the desk that he had been leaning on during his pep talk. And with equally exquisite timing, the ketchup from the packet he had just smashed with his hand displayed a gentle ruby arc before landing on the front of Don Sugg's polycotton short-sleeved dress shirt, just missing the large Vote for Fro button pinned at his heart. That impression seemed to sum up the sense of what Huey expected from the staff. It is a fairly undisputed observation that precious few individuals have multiple good ideas, concepts that change our lives often for the better. On the other hand, quite a few individuals have but one good idea— and it takes them through life, and sometimes into history. For every Leonardo, you have twenty one-hit wonders. But for Clark, his great idea came as a practical joke. As Huey had juxtaposed the economic troubles of the people of South Florida with the anti-cram campaign of their opponents, Clark suddenly had a flashback to the website that had blamed everything on the physical object money that everybody in every economy used. It was then that his great idea struck, the idea which, in days to come, he wished he had never had, but at the moment, he was overwhelmed with the temptation to play a joke on these incompetent people who were treating him like an illiterate office boy. Mr. Ormond, I was reading something on the Internet the other day which might help us. It might really turn this thing around in a big way. Clark tried to sound enthusiastic about the idea, even though he thought the whole thing was silly. Well, speak up, boy. Let's have it. Huey was planning to use the boy's idea, whatever it was, to get the rest of the staff to get off their lazy mental backsides and do some creative work. There's this guy on the Internet that says there's a way to run the country without taxes and with nobody having to pay for food or a place to live and such. Why don't we use his ideas as a way to get the people's minds on the economy and away from Aaron's anti-crime issues? We could promise an end to taxes, not just cutting them like all the other candidates. We could say we would stop unemployment forever and have stable prices without government controls. Clark's ideas were getting rather mixed up, but one of the other staffers, a speechwriter, jumped in with his eyes aglow. He has a way to do away with taxes and end unemployment? Boy, what a stump speech I could write with those issues. Clark was encouraged to continue, so he searched his memory and came up with a few more points. He says that nobody should have to pay for food or clothes or a place to live or medicine, and that prices shouldn't change at all. He says that unemployment is completely unnecessary. That's silly. You can't do that. Who would pay for all that stuff without taxes? You have to have taxes. Suggs was in no mood to accept any new ideas today, particularly one that was off the wall pie in the sky as this one. This guy says all we have to do is change our money, and all these things will happen without the government being involved at all. You can look it up. Clark was beginning to sweat because Suggs was saying what he himself was thinking about the idea. But Huey was not about to let the others off the hook that easily. Wait a minute, guys. It doesn't have to really work. It just has to win this election. Who's going to remember a year from now what we promised in the campaign? 
All we need is what you might call plausible deniability. That will last for about three months, and then who cares whether this guy knows what he's talking about or not. So unless you can come up with something better by the end of the day, we'll go with this money stuff starting tomorrow. Now, Huey thought, to make these other bozos get their brains in gear, I'll make it look like I am serious about using this cockamamie idea by putting our writers on it. Clark, I want you and Ed and Doris to look at this website and get some more specifics for issues we can hammer them with. Here's how I see it developing. First, we say we have a new idea that will get rid of all our economic, uh, no make that home security problems. Home security, like in groceries and mortgages, get it? It's a play on homeland security, but it hits them in their pocketbooks, and you know how the voters will vote their wallets every time. Well, never mind. I'm sure you can come up with something good. We'll hold back on what our solution is until the opposition starts saying it's impossible, and then hit them with the change in money thing. By then, I want a campaign to make it sound plausible, complete with references and website citations so the people can go see it for themselves. We can create some of the websites ourselves. Clark, you still got some contacts back from college, right? We need some authorities that we can quote to back us up on this stuff. Oh, and see what else you can find out about this on the Internet. Doris, I want you to see what you can do with the little old lady and soccer mom angles on this. I want something that will pull those blue hairs out of the bingo parlors and into the voting booths. Ed, we're going to need something that appeals to the business community. Get some ideas from Clark here and then knock out about a ten-minute speech that makes it sound like the solution to every businessman's problems. Huey paused. He felt like Jimmy Cagney in the classic old movie One, Two, Three, snapping out decisive orders and making people jump. He thought perhaps he should see if he couldn't rent that movie tonight and pick up some pointers. After this campaign, he would probably be looking for work, and it might be good if he could sound more like Cagney than like Burt Lancaster and Elmer Gantry. I'll have more for you tomorrow if the rest of these bozos don't come up with something better, Huey growled. Now get out of here and get to work. Saturday. August 6th, progress reports. Ed was like a puppy with a fresh bone. This is the way I see it. If we hit them with everything at once, they won't get any of it. So what we do is take just one or two issues for each crowd selected for that specific audience. Get them to understand those issues, and let's put the website in the TV spots. Now, the TV spots are also a single issue. We'll use the demographics to see which ads we put on which stations and at what times of day. I don't think we should use more than three points in any one market area, so we'll need to pick and choose carefully. Now, we can turn out about two ads a day, so we need to wait on the TV ads for about three days to get a full set ready. Then, while those are running, we can see which points seem to have the most impact and make more careful ads based on those. Here, this is a speech for tomorrow's county fair. I figure we're going to have a lot of young middle-class families, so we'll go with the full employment and stable prices points. Then for the older audiences, that afternoon, we have the free housing and free medical care. For the business groups, first thing in the morning, we use no taxes and no government regulation. I knocked out about three other talks just for the poorer neighborhoods. The free food and housing is the main emphasis there. For the college kids, free education, of course, along with free room and board. Slow down, Ed. Take it easy, Huey said, patting Ed on the back. It sounds like you really got excited about this angle. Huey, if I can't sell stuff like this, I don't deserve to be called an ad man. I mean, free stuff and no taxes? you got to be kidding. It's a slam dunk, even for a guy as short as I am. Okay, does anyone have any better ideas than the one Ed is rolling with? Come on, guys. You're going to let some spoiled kid who never did an honest day's work in his life beat you out? Sorry, kid. Suddenly, Clark no longer felt ashamed of his idea. He wasn't afraid to talk in the meeting. He wanted so badly to show up these men that he wasn't even self-conscious about being slightly pear-shaped and round-faced. He felt a burning desire to embarrass them, to humble them, to make them dance to his tune. If his father had been there, he would have said it was the making of the boy. But this is crazy, Don Suggs fumed. You can't promise everybody all this free stuff. For one thing, they'll never believe it. For another, the other candidate will laugh you out of the campaign. You'll never get work in politics again. It'll be a debacle. So where's your better idea, Don? Clark said, his back straight, his shoulders back, his chin out thrust. Your ideas have been top dog up until now, and look where they've gotten us, 30 points behind in the last poll. If anybody's going to be blamed for Frobisher finishing a poor second to Constable, it won't be me, it'll be you. Clark's eyes were flashing. Don just looked at him, his mouth open in shock. Even Huey, without consciously realizing it, began to respect Clark just a little. Enough of that, Huey barked. If you don't have a better idea to offer, get on board or get off the track, because we're coming through, with you or over you. There was a long silence. 
finally broken by Doris saying, I have to get these ads to the producers if we're going to have any TV spots ready by the weekend. Huey felt trapped by his own psychological trick. He had been so sure that the other older Pauls would have been able to come up with something, especially when they were out competing against a glorified office boy, for crying out loud. But somehow, the new Clark that had jumped up and savaged Don right before their eyes made it feel just a little dangerous to throw any other ideas out on the table just then. So they sat quietly, and the longer the silence grew, the more difficult it was to break it. Don, of course, was so angry that he wouldn't have made a suggestion even if it was the best idea he had ever had. If they were going to take this kid's ideas over his, then they could just lose by a record margin. He still had some contacts who might be able to get him a position with the constable campaign. Of course, it wouldn't be quite what he had with Frobisher, but after the way Huey had spattered him with ketchup yesterday and hadn't backed him up when the kid went crazy, Don was willing to take a cut in pay and status to get some payback. Besides, he could let the constable campaign know what a crazy thing Frobisher Camp was going to try. That ought to be good for something. Well, it looks like we go with the freebies campaign, Huey said with a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. Ed, you seem to have a lot of ideas for how to present this stuff. I want a base speech that Frobisher can use, and then plug the particular issues into that speech. That way he won't have to learn so much as he switches from one kind of crowd to another. You can farm out the particular issues to Tom and Neil for making the five-minute or so issue segments. Clark, I want as much academic support for this idea as you can come up with. College professors of economics and such. We also want websites we can send the public to so that they can see we aren't just making up fairy tales about all this free stuff. Doris, when we see which groups this plays with best, we want to have more speeches in front of those groups for the backgrounds of the TV spots. We want lots of enthusiasm on the faces of the audience. Oh, and one more thing, Clark. We have the first of the debates we agreed to back last month when this was a close race coming up in about three weeks. You have to figure out what the other side is going to try to attack us on and have defenses ready. You know they're going to say this is a crazy idea. We need something that stops them cold. All right, everybody, get to work. Huey turned on his heel and left the room for his office. He had to talk to Frobisher. Prescott, you know we got trouble in this campaign, Huey said, almost pleadingly into the phone. I mean, we are the incumbent, and the economy is in a tank, and the old folks that voted for you last time to save their Social Security aren't exactly happy over the inflation and the price of gas. I know, I know, Huey said the tired voice in reply. The incumbent always gets blamed for whatever's going wrong, even if it ain't his fault. But I've done lots of good things for this district the last six years. We've got to keep reminding them of that. Like those defense contracts I got last term. They meant millions to the local economy. Yes, Press, Huey said soothingly, but the people's pockets are empty now. There's all this, this unemployment and the prices are going through the roof. The voters don't care squat about what you did for them last year. They want something right now, and I think we have something to offer them. What do you mean, Huey? What haven't we offered them already? We came up with a new plan yesterday, and the staff is really enthusiastic about it, Huey said, trying to feel a little enthusiasm about it himself and not succeeding. You should have heard Ed. He was saying he could sell this stuff in his sleep. I mean, we can top anything Constable is talking about. She's saying she'll cut taxes more than you have, and she's saying she'll get more jobs and so on. Well, we can do a lot better than that. What's better than more jobs, Huey? What's better than lower taxes? How are we going to top that? Prescott? Mr. Congressman, we really can, but I'm going to need to explain a lot more than I can do over the phone. I want you to come into headquarters this afternoon. We'll get someone else to take your speeches. This is top priority. This can save this campaign. It's that important. Huey heard deafening silence on the other end of the wire as he nervously ran his nails down the front of his Prescott for Congress pocket protector. Finally came the congressman's familiar throat clearing, as though he was a preacher tuning to say grace, and then... Joe boy, how long you been with me? How long now? I about eight, I'd, I'd about I'd say eight years, sir. Eight years. Yes, sir. Eight years. Repeated Huey, realizing his boss's dilatory exercise. He sometimes believed that he could tell to the second when the hamster wheel would start turning. Okay, son. If you think I should, I'll come in right after lunch in Bonita Springs. You really think we have a chance with this new idea of yours, sir? I really do. Orman said with his most sincere voice and with his fingers crossed. I'll be there. Got to run now. Bye. Goodbye, sir. Huey sat down behind his desk and thought as hard as he had in years. Prescott has got to buy into this or he'll never be able to sell it to the voters. He's going to have to be a born-again politician with the fervor of the newly converted. 
How am I ever going to convince him that this silly idea is the real thing? Can I trust Clark to... Nah. How about Ed? No, he only cares about what great copy it makes. I don't think he has any idea how it works, nor cares. Don's out of the question. He wouldn't sell this idea if his life depended on it. None of the other guys know that much about it. I guess I'll have to do it myself. Lord, if I ever needed your help, I need it now. Please let me see the way and understand your plan and hand in all this. I'm an old man now and have already lived most of my life. I've been broke before and got through it. But, Lord, the whole country is in trouble now. And if Prescott doesn't win, I won't be able to seek your path in Washington ever again. Please, Lord, if it be your will, let me be a light unto others in these terrible times. Amen. Feeling oddly refreshed and a little surprised at the prayer that he had fallen into in his thoughts, Huey Ormond left his office to find Clark and get some instruction on this crazy, no, mustn't think it's crazy, this innovative money idea. Invisible Hand, Chapter 3, Meeting Brianna, in which we discover Neil's relationship with Brianna is not what it might be. Brianna ended the call and glanced momentarily at the screen as if there was something else she meant to say to her father. With a slight sniff, she turned away from the screen, calling, Johnny, Laura, Granddad's at the airport. He'll be here in a few minutes. Please get your room cleaned up and put away your toys. We want Granddad to see the apartment at its best now. Yes, Mommy, came from another room, bringing a brief and somewhat skeptical smile to her lips as she visualized how the room would look after her father arrived. Then she got a worried look again, and she pensively walked rather slowly through through her neat for the moment somewhat spartan living room toward her own bedroom. Once there, she crossed to the dresser, opened her jewelry box, and removed from the bottom several folded sheets of paper. Then she sat on the bed and unfolded the pages. There were letters her father had written to her over the years when she was a little girl. The last of them had come some sixteen years before, and they had been her solace and her torment for the years of her father's captivity. There had been a time when she could not read them without tears, both for her father's situation and for what they said about their relationship. She chose to read the last. How many times had she read that letter telling her that her daddy wasn't coming home for Christmas after all, she reflected. Once again, a bittersweet blend of emotions swept over her as she remembered the circumstances surrounding that letter, how she and her mom had missed him so much. In the blink of a tear-filled eye, the apartment had gone from warm and close with two presents already on daddy's chair, to an odd and distant place. Standing at her bureau, staring blankly now at the end of the letter and the creases it had from endless folding and unfolding, Brianna remembered how scared she had been when, several months after that Christmas, a very serious strange man in a black suit had wanted to talk to Mom alone. Brianna remembered straining as hard as she could to hear from her bedroom what the strange man was saying, but she couldn't get a word. Then, after only a few minutes, he left and suddenly, for no reason she could think of, she felt chills. Then the roof simply fell in when the official who had told her mother that her recently divorced ex-husband had been kidnapped and they had no idea where he was. There was no other expression for it. In the several months following that horrible news, Brianna must have changed her mind a dozen times at least about whether to hate her father for abandoning her or forgive him for something beyond his power to prevent. Of course, in the letter, he had blamed his job and circumstances which prevented his homecoming. He had professed his undying love for her. Sometimes she could believe it, but most of the time she could not. She sighed again and returned the letters to their place under her costume jewelry, nestled in the warm wooden box, the Christmas letter on top, as it always managed to be. She still didn't know what to feel about her father. She was proud of what he had done and of the good things that existed in the world because of him. She was angry that he thought more of those other children than he did of her. She felt abandoned, yet she could sometimes, just a little, feel his love in his letters. But then, at other times, she cynically thought that it was easy to talk of love when you didn't really mean it at all. But the one thing she knew was that her own children would never live with the uncertainty and self-doubt that her father's life had unintentionally inflicted upon her mother and her. No, the kids of the world would never hear of her, let alone benefit by her efforts in any way she could envision. But she could provide a steady, reliable home for her own children. And now, she thought to herself as she turned to go out to the kids' room, from the sublime to the truly ridiculous, as it was getting harder and harder for her to check the kids' cleaning efforts without bursting into laughter. They did try, bless them, but it just seemed as though, Mom! swept through the short hallway like a whirlwind. Mom, come see! Neil looked at the apartment building. Victoria Close, Dickens' house, was the title emblazoned on the brass plaque to the right of the entryway. 
The style did remind him very much of some of the buildings he had seen in London, but the number of stories seemed too great to be practical in 1890s London. Street lights could have been actual gas lights for all he could tell. There was iron grill work and decorations around the windows and what he assumed were false chimneys showing above the edge of the roof. To the right and left of the main building, which took up most of the long block, were the ends of other buildings of the same style and size. On the other side of the street, behind Neil, as he stared up at the apartment complex, there were three-story commercial buildings holding a variety of consumer stores and shops. At least the streets are clean and all the windows are intact, Neil muttered to himself. There was nothing ominous showing, but of course that meant nothing. There was the entry with several wide doors leading into some sort of lobby that he could see flashes of as a few people came and went. It seemed well lit and clean, yet for some reason Neil's feet seemed reluctant to walk the few steps that would put him in the building. A flood of memories of his time with Brianna were washing over him. He was becoming frightened now of seeing her again. Would she accept him? Would she merely tolerate him? Would he like his grandchildren? He could remember a score of events in the life of Brianna the baby and Brianna the toddler and Brianna the child. But he only had a couple of brief conversations with her as Brianna the adult. He really couldn't say he knew her. He might have walked past her in a crowd without realizing the woman was his daughter. All the eagerness to see her that had gripped him on the plane and at the airport had drained away and left him with a hollow feeling, perhaps of dread or shame or guilt. There was no longer the buffer of time and distance between them, those variables that can fashion a happy ending from almost anything and smooth the rough edges of reality. Knowing it would be even worse if he were caught just standing on the curb, unmoving and fixing a cheerful expression on his face, he went up the steps and through the door. There was a listing of tenants in the room numbers just inside the entry. He found that his daughter had an apartment on the third floor. The elevator was clean and worked quietly and quickly. As he approached the door with her number on it, his daughter opened the door when he was a few feet away. She was short and slim with dark brown hair and eyes and was wearing a simple white skirt and blouse outfit with an apron that appeared colorful because of the paint splotches on it. Come in, come in, we're so happy and excited to see you, she bubbled. Neil stepped over the door sill into a simple living room with a three-seat couch, an easy chair, coffee table, some original paintings on two of the walls where the light from the north-facing windows could illuminate them, and a large darkened flat-panel TV screen that dominated the fourth wall. Two grinning children came running in from the next room. Neil held out his right hand to his daughter, and she moved right past it to give him a big hug. After a pleasant moment, Neil thought, How did she know I was about to knock on the door? The pleasure dropped away. Hello, daughter, he managed. Then releasing her, he asked with a big smile, Who are these two handsome children? They're your grandchildren, silly. John, Laura, say hello to your grandfather. Hello, grandfather, they chorused. Did you bring us anything? And grabbed at his bags. Children, he isn't Santa Claus. Let him sit down and rest. I'm sure he's had a long, tiring flight coming all the way from Europe. Then she pointed at the suitcases and said, John, take that smaller bag into the guest room and don't you dare open it. The boy, about eight, Neil estimated, reached for the larger bag and said, Okay, will I get paid? When you get back, Neil said, perhaps I'll have something for you. He sat at one end of the couch, and the girl, about four years old, climbed up beside him and sat on her knees, staring at him. Can I get you something to eat or drink? You look a little tired. Well, my body does think it's about bedtime. Would you like to take a nap before dinner? No, I'd like to get to know you and my grandchildren better first, he said, and stroked Laura's cheek and smiled at her. Food for the soul. Just then, the boy ran back into the room and said, I put the suitcase on the floor by the bed. Is that okay? That's fine, Neil said. Now let's see if I have anything for you, and reached into his pocket for his wallet. Opening it, he took out a five-euro note. What do you think of this? What is it? the girl asked. It's money, the boy scoffed. Don't you know money when you see it? That isn't money, the girl shot back. Money's in the pewter. Not this kind, said the boy. This is from... He looked at the bill, apparently trying to read where it came from on the bill. Oh, from Europe! You remember Europe on the globe, Laura, her mother said. We just looked at it a little while ago when I was showing you how far your granddad was coming to see you. I remember, the girl said with exasperation. It's on the other side of the ocean. Then she reached out, grabbed the bill away from her brother, jumped off the couch, and ran for the next room. Hey, come back with my pay, you thief! The boy shouted and took off after her. Be gentle with her, John. Remember, she's still little, his mother warned. Then turning to Neil, sitting in the easy chair, she said in a quiet voice, I'll have Tony take, make a copy of the bill at the library for Laura. That way they can each have one. They look good, very healthy and happy. Are things going well for all of you? Well, pretty well. Tony is still struggling with his dissertation. 
Sometimes I think he'll never finish it. But it's so important to him that I hate to even ask him about it if it isn't progressing well. It's okay for you to ask about it, but just don't mention getting it published. He doesn't like to let me even read anything he's written until he thinks it's just right. He's at the library doing research for it. The kids don't bother him there, of course, and he can talk to several of his friends who are also doing research there. But how are you doing, daughter? I came to visit with you more than anyone, Neil said, looking rather intently at her. Oh, I'm doing fine, she said, with only a hint of doubt in her voice. I still get to do some work now and then. Tony doesn't mind taking over the kids when they study history or English research methods. I can often get a couple of hours in. That picture on your left is one I finished just last week. Neil turned his attention to the picture and began noticing details about the apartment. The picture had only a plain wood frame, but was rather a nice painting of children playing on a swing. The larger child was pushing the smaller child, who was apparently shrieking happily with excitement. From the clothes, Neil couldn't tell the genders of the children. The apartment, though, was rather plainly furnished with rounded furniture, not a sharp corner on anything. It looked used, but sturdy. He could see that the children were used to treating it roughly, but the material of the upholstery wasn't stained or torn at all. The colors in the room were cheerful, matching those outside in the hall and lobby. It was spring, and the windows were open, letting a gentle breeze billow the translucent drapes from time to time. The painting of the children on the swing complemented the other paintings on the walls. From the style of the works, they were both apparently done by his daughter as well. The TV screen, alone on its wall, seemed to Neil somewhat ominous, as if the human paintings were trying to sh stay away from it. That's nonsense, he thought, and tried to direct his mind into more hopeful topics. This is quite nice. You've made it very cheerful. You can tell the children really love one another. Neil shifted around to face Brianna. Are you making out all right? It's true we don't have much money, Dad, she said soberly. Most of what we have comes from my pay for caring for our children. I try to save it for paints and canvas and such stuff, and you'll be sleeping in what I use for a studio. That costs us something each month. Tony has some income from work he did years ago, and he does some lecturing at the community college, but of course he won't get paid for that for years. I think he just does that work because he loves lecturing. Anyway, since we don't go out much, I save by using standard clothes most of the time. But I really am happy. I have these wonderful kids, and I love Tony, and we get by all right. Can I help you out? I, I, I seem to have become rich. Well, it seems rich to me anyway. The computer tells me that I have over $80,000. Maybe I could give you a few thousand, at least until Tony gets his book published and makes you all really rich. He felt like he was on dangerous ground since he didn't want to offend her. But damn it, he was her father. A father has a right to pamper and spoil his daughter sometimes. After all, he hadn't even seen her in years. Oh, Dad, she said, smiling broadly at him. You can't give me money. You can take me out to eat and give me some really good paintbrushes, though. I'll take you to the store tomorrow if you feel up to it. Would it upset Tony if I gave you some money? He asked. No, Dad, it would astonish him, she said with a laugh. You really, truly can't give me or anyone else the money in your account. You can spend it to buy things for someone, but you can't give money to them. The only way to get money out of your account is to spend it, and when you spend it, it's just gone. The money you spend isn't anywhere anymore, just like it wasn't anywhere before you got paid. Our money isn't transferable. Then how do you buy things if you can't trade your money for them? It doesn't make sense, Neil frowned. Brianna took his hand. You just spend it. You don't care where it goes. When you want something that's for sale, you tell the computer you want to buy it, and the computer deducts the money from your account and transfers ownership of the item to you. Haven't you spent any money yet? I paid the cabbie for bringing me in from the airport. Well, there you go. You had money deducted from your account, and for that, you bought a cab ride. See, it was easy, wasn't it? Well, sure, it was easy. I gave the cabbie some of the money in my account. But you didn't, Dad. That cabbie didn't get that money at all. It just stopped being. The numbers in your account got smaller, but that didn't make the numbers in the cabbie's account get any larger. You mean somebody else got that money? Maybe the company? I give up. You just won't believe me. Never mind, you'll learn that you can't give anybody any of your money. We'll see. I'll find some way, Neil smiled at her. Dad, didn't they tell you anything about how our money works? Sure, I remember there was something in the news back before my 15-year vacation, but I was too busy at the time to really pay attention, and during my treatment after my release, they told me a little and they gave me this brochure to read, but I never bothered. I mean, what's to know? I've been using money all my life. Dad, you really... Tony's in the elevator, the TV announced. Neil jumped a little and looked at the TV, which, like the TV at the airport, didn't appear to be on. The kids came out of the other room. Johnny won't let me play with the Euro, Laura announced as if summing up her case before a judge. I'm going to tell Daddy that you aren't helping me learn about money. He'll make you give it to me for a little while. 
It's five euros, and he won't make me do any such thing, said the young defendant, pleading his case. The bill is mine. You heard Granddad say he was giving it to me as pay. Since it's mine, I don't have to let you or anyone else touch it, do I, Mama? Tony is here, the TV slipped in. Laura ran to the door and snatched it open. Well, that explained how Brianna had known when he arrived that he was just outside the door. Daddy, Daddy, Johnny won't let me play with the euro. Make him let me play with it, she demanded. What's all this about a euro? asked the middle-aged man wearing whites with a straw hat and carrying a briefcase as he bent down to pick up Laura. It's mine, Dad, put in John, eager to state his case before the judge and waving the bill safely out of reach of his shorter sister. Granddad gave it to me for tucking his suitcase into his room, didn't you, Granddad? How do you do, Neil said, extending a hand. I'm Neil Campbell, Brianna's father. I'm afraid I got you into a mess with my present to John. It wasn't a present. I earned it. I worked for it. Now you won't have to carry that bag into the bedroom. That's a benefit to you, isn't it? John maintained stoutly. Take it easy, Johnny, his dad smiled down at him. Johnny's supposed to share, isn't he, Daddy? He's not supposed to keep everything for himself, Laura put in quickly. Laura's not supposed to just take my things either, is she, Dad? Tony looked at Neil. Did you give that bill to John for work he did for you? Well, sort of both as a present and for the work, admitted Neil. I have some euro coins I was going to give Laura as her present. He reached into his pocket, took out three coins, and extended this shiny temptation toward Laura. Laura reached out her hand and carefully took the three coins, thought a moment, then said, I got three euros and you just got one. Tony set his daughter back on the floor with her prize and addressed both the children. John, the bill is yours. You earned it. So, Laura, you should not even touch it without Johnny's permission. Do you understand me, Laura? Yes, Daddy, but isn't Johnny supposed to share? Her contrition changed quickly to indignation. Yes, Laura, he is. But if I make him let you use his things, he isn't sharing at all, is he? That would just be me forcing him to do something against his will. It would be me threatening to hurt him in some way if he didn't let others control what belongs to him. It would just make him mad mad at me and mad at you. Since I can't be with you all the time, he might do something to hurt you when I wasn't there. So, Laura, by making him let you play with his things, I'd be making the two of you enemies. You don't want Johnny to be your enemy. You want him to be your friend. Turning his attention to the boy, he continued, Johnny, if you own something and don't want to share it, then you have every right to keep it to yourself. Your mother and I won't punish you for doing that. We will be disappointed. We will be saddened. But we won't punish you. On the other hand, if you keep everything you own to yourself, why will others want to help you? Why will they care what happens to you? Why will they care whether you have things to play with? You see, Johnny, Laura won't always be a little girl. Someday she'll be a young woman. Someday there'll be things she can do for you that you'll really want her to do. If you teach her now that you won't do anything for her, it'll be very hard for her to change her mind later. And Johnny, she's too young now to learn this lesson that I want you to learn. But someday... I want you to help me teach her the same lesson. Both children looked rather solemn for a few seconds. Then John said, Here, Laura, you can play with my euros for a while. Laura grabbed the bill and ran for the other room before he could change his mind. Dad, are you sure this will work? John asked doubtfully. His dad gave him a big hug and said, Son, it always works for me, but sometimes it takes a while. I was nice to your mother for weeks before she was willing to marry me. Just be patient. I'll even let you stay up 30 minutes later after Laura goes to bed tonight because you made me feel so good by letting her play with your money. Oh, boy. Thanks, Dad. Okay, fellas, Brianna said. Do I have to cook tonight, or can we go out to the good and quick for supper? Tony looked a little doubtful. Mr. Campbell, do you feel up to going out, or would you rather just relax and eat here? All we have is standard food, but your daughter's a good cook when she puts her mind to it. How about if I take you all out to supper? I have lots of money, it turns out, and I'd be happy to spend some of it on you, Neil said. Brianna frowned and said, Dad, there aren't any luxury restaurants for families near here. It'd be a lot of trouble. I'd have to get the kids all dressed up. And Neil threw up his hand, shook his head, and said, Tony, I should have known better than to go against a woman's suggestion for what to do for supper. I guess I really have been away from the country for too long. We go to good and quick, and we like it. Tony grinned and said, Well, in that case, I'm ready to go. How about you? Are you hungry yet? I could use a few minutes to freshen up and shave. Fine, about 20 minutes then. I'll start organizing the kids, Tony replied. Brianna took Neil's arm and guided him toward the guest room. Dad, the good and quick is just down the block, and it's quick, and the food is good. I want you to be able to have with us what you want to eat, rather than just taking potluck with us. Neil went into the room she indicated. It had its own bathroom. 
Things were worse than he'd thought, though. They didn't even have enough food to feed one extra guest. Well, he was definitely going to pay for the meal tonight and see if he couldn't go to a, a grocery store and bring home more food. Invisible Hand, Chapter 4 Who's the Joke On? In which Clark's joke works too well or not well enough. About 5 p.m. Saturday, August 7th, 2010 so you see, Prescott, it's like everything you do that helps someone else, you get paid for it. And the people who do the paying get the power and respect they deserve for paying as they should. It all balances out. If you do something bad, it costs you money. And if you do nothing, it costs you money you might have earned. It's a reward system. You just don't get rewarded for hurting other people. I get it, Huey. The Bible says that money is the root of all evil. We're going to change money so it's a root of good. We're going to make it God's money, not Satan's money. Yes, sir. I think you're right on the money. That's exactly what we'll do. Huey was a little light-headed since he'd skipped lunch to prepare for his talk with Frobisher. And Frobisher hadn't seemed to understand it at all until Huey had drawn three circles with arrows going clockwise from circle to circle. He labeled the circle at the top producers, the circle on the right consumers, and the circle on the left payers. It was like a light going off in Prescott's mind. That's just like the three branches of government, he said. Each one controls the next, so they stay balanced. That way, none of the three can get too powerful and dominate. From then on, it was like feeding candy to a baby. Frobisher believed everything. He especially liked the idea that the pairs would be mostly old folks like themselves who had retired, but who were still important, respected, and even admired for their paying. Huey secretly thought that Frobisher didn't really understand at all, but merely wanted to believe so strongly that Huey could have been offering snake oil and he still would have bought it. But that didn't matter. The important thing was that Frobisher was sold and very enthusiastic about it. Now all I have to do is get him together with Ed and get him started memorizing those new speeches. The Lord's will be done. Saturday, August 14th, 2010, a week later. Ed, I just got off the phone with Prescott. He said the crowd really ate it up when he gave them that new speech. He said that by the end they were on their feet, cheering every line. He wanted some punching up on the education one. He said it just didn't generate the rhythm that the others do. Yeah, I know what he means. That was one I asked Clark to write. He's pretty good, but he isn't a professional and doesn't have the experience. I'll do that one myself now that I have the time. Tell Prescott I'll have it for him by tonight. Doris, Huey said, turning her way. We've had three days of these new talks and the crowds are growing. Have we gotten any interest in the local stations on covering one of Frobisher's presentations? Yes, sir. I got a station from Tampa and one from Miami to send a reporter to this morning's talk in Fort Myers. For some reason, the Fort Myers station wasn't interested. I guess they've already written Frobisher off, but I did get the paper there to promise that they would send a reporter. It's better than nothing. Do what you can to get that local station. Hang in there, Doris. Then Huey went back into his office, closed the door, and got on the phone. Doris turned to look at Tom, whose desk was beside hers. Tom, did you hear that? He was nice to me. He actually was trying to make me feel better about not getting the local station. What is it with him? Two weeks ago, he would have chewed my head off for not getting them. Since this new campaign started, he just isn't the same guy. Well, I for one am all for the change. I'm getting twice the work done now that I don't have him cussing me out for every little flub. And have you noticed Clark? Now that Huey isn't always calling him an office boy, he started to act like a man. Huey's even given him some important things to do, like preparing the outline for the debate next week. Hallelujah and come to Jesus. Even if we are losing this campaign, at least it feels good to come to work now. It must have been that meeting that Frobisher had with him. Maybe he put the fear of God into him. Could be. Whoops, there's my phone. Back to work. Wednesday, August 25th, 2010. Prescott, listen, we just got the latest polls in. We've gained 10 points in just the last week. It's now about 58 to 40 or so. You're really doing the job out there. Thanks, Huey. I feel like a new man, too. You know, this new money of yours really seems to be solving so many problems for so many people. I was talking in a poor Hispanic neighborhood last night, telling him about the free food and housing, and when somehow I got off onto who the payers would be. It struck me that anybody could be a payer, and it wouldn't matter whether they were rich or poor, black or white, brown or yellow. I started emphasizing that they themselves could be payers and do something about the conditions in their neighborhoods, that they could see that the roads were maintained where they live and that the kids got a good education. You know, they were even cheering that. They really seemed to like the idea that they could be the ones judging how much pay the rich folks would get.
You might mention that to Ed. Yes, sir, I will. But we have to get ready for the debate day after tomorrow. We have momentum now, and we can't risk losing it. We have your schedule cleared for this afternoon and tomorrow with just a couple of speeches to give the media something to show on the evening news. By the way, have you noticed how much more time we're getting on the local news these days? Doris tells me that there are three local stations that have cameras on you for every speech. Huey, I don't need to prepare for that debate. The Lord will tell me what to say. Whenever I've gotten off the prepared speech, it's worked out very well. I think the crowds can tell I really mean what I'm saying. I think the Lord is inspiring me. Huey, we're doing the Lord's work in this campaign. He won't let me fail. You just get me people to talk to, and the Lord will convince them through me. But Prescott, you need to have the answers ready for the questions they might ask. Prescott, this is big. If we blow this debate, we might as well hang it up. Son, we aren't bigger than the Lord. If he wants me to win this one, we'll win it. I tell you, son, the Lord will tell me what to say. Now, I got to eat breakfast to keep my strength up. Bye. Huey put the phone down carefully almost reverently. What have I done to him? Has he lost his mind? This isn't a revival meeting. This is politics. If he starts spouting that Lord's Will stuff on camera, he's going to ruin everything. I have to find out what he's saying at those local stump speeches. Doris, can you get me some video of one or two of the speeches he's been giving on the stump? I need it fast if you can arrange it. He said through the open door to the outer office. I think I can get some. The local station is showing a lot of Frobisher these days because the crowds are so demonstrative, so they should have plenty of footage. Less than an hour later, Huey and his top aides, along with Clark, were gathered around a big screen TV watching their candidate on the stump. The crowd was cheerful as if expecting a good show. Frobisher got an introduction from the local VIP, then took the microphone. He said a couple of nice things about local institutions and then began to talk about the troubles they were having. You could see people's heads nodding as he mentioned the unemployment and, and the difficulty in getting dare care for the kids. He talked about the price of gas and how hard it was to make those mortgage payments, and you could see the crowd was feeling it. Then he said, Ending unemployment? We can do this. Homes for everyone? We can do this. Daycare for all the children? We can do this. With each we can do this, the crowd would yell, Yes, or we can. Then Frobisher pulled a small black book from his coat and held it up before the crowd. I am a Christian, and this is my Bible. With my hand on the Bible, I swear to you that everything I have said to you here tonight is true. We really can do these things, and I have found the way. With God's leadership, we will change things. These evil times will be behind us, and we will have a new life, free of these hardships. This I swear to you upon my immortal soul and with my hand on the Bible. The crowd, which had been respectfully quiet when Prescott held up the Bible and had taken his oath, burst into wild cheers and almost mobbed the stage, holding out their arms toward him. Prescott stood looking out over the crowd with his Bible still pressed between his two hands. His face had an almost unworldly look as of a man possessed. Ed, did you write that part at the end with the Bible and the oath? Hugh asked. No, I never bring religion into any of the speeches. This is an economic thing, not a religious thing. I had no idea he was putting it out on the end. I mean, the we can do this is mine, but the rest is all Prescott. It's really effective, though. You can see that he completely believes what he's saying. But how is that going to play in the debate? Are any of the questioners going to ask about that taking an oath on the Bible? Huey asked Doris. I don't think so. We haven't put anything like that in the TV ads. We've used the crowd shots, though, like there at the end with them holding out their arms and screaming, Doris said. You'd think he was a rock star the way we're carrying on. But a lot of those people were middle-aged women and men. That was a suburban shopping center. I can't believe it, you amused wonderingly. I think we are going to win this race. I don't think there's a thing that the constable campaign can do to stop us. We're not only going to win, we're going to win easily. The others looked at Huey and then at each other. What have we done? Ed said quietly to himself. Tuesday, September 7th, 2010 in the morning. Huey, we're getting national news coverage of Frobisher. It seems that word of his comeback and the crowds he's drawing is news in and of itself. We're having a rally at the high school football field in Naples. The locals say we should have over 20,000 people there. We have people coming in from Miami and Tampa and St. Petersburg. They're beginning to worry about the parking. Three local stations are covering it live at 7. Okay, Doris, great job. I think it's time for Clark to show us the bombshell he says he's been working on. This is our best chance to get maximum coverage. Ask him to come in, will you? She turned and yelled, Clark, get your bombshell in here. Huey says it's time. And she turned back to Huey with a grin. 
He really does have a bombshell, boss. He told me about it yesterday. It should blow your socks off. Clark hurried in from his office. He had his own office now, with a folder that was surprisingly thin to hold a bombshell. Son, the whole world will be watching tonight. This is the time to hit him with everything we've got. Now what's this bombshell you want to detonate? Sir, what would you think of a single law that we can write on just a couple of pages that implements this whole new money system? The whole shooting match on both sides of a single sheet of paper. We can make passage of that law our platform. That way the people can see exactly what they're getting. When they vote for us, they vote for that law. Frobisher promises to do everything he can to get that law passed exactly as it is, with no amendments, no changes. Two pages? Huey's eyebrows went up. Only two pages? Yes, sir. It really is that simple. Now, the transition from the old money to this new money will require some additional legislation, but this law really is the new money. It's the heart and soul of what makes the new money what it is. If this law is passed, it won't matter how the transition is handled, since everything straightens out after the changeover. Son, I think you were right about this being a bombshell. Huey shook his head. This is not politics as usual. This is the most specific thing I ever heard of in a political campaign. If there were any doubters as to whether we had a real plan, I think this will be the, all the evidence they need. This will either lock up this election or blow us all into oblivion. I'll run this past Prescott and see what he thinks. I'm betting on oblivion, thought Clark. If this bill doesn't stop this runaway campaign, nothing will. This makes it obvious what a crackpot idea the whole thing is. They've talked their way into a corner, and they're going to get squashed like a roach. Congratulations, Doris said, smiling at Clark. It looks like you really came through for us again. You've really saved this campaign for all of us. And she gave him a hug. It was a motherly thing to do, since Doris was a good twenty years older than Clark, but it reflected real affection nonetheless. Clark felt a moment of guilt, but then hardened his heart. Don had long ago left the campaign, but he still remembered Huey and the others making fun of him when he first joined the campaign. Clark was, was certain now he would have the last laugh. Tuesday, September 7th, 2010, afternoon, at Huey's office. There are ten points in this bill. Each is an essential part of the whole. None of them can be changed without destroying the idea. They must be passed as a set. Do you understand, Prescott? Huey was speaking earnestly and with a bit of pleading in his voice. Sure, it's simple. Ten points, just like the Ten Commandments. I won't forget. You can't change the Ten Commandments, and you can't change the Ten Points. But, Prescott, these are not chiseled in stone. They have to get through Congress without amendments. You know how the committee system works. Somebody's going to want to change something to give some of his contributors an advantage, and before you know it, the Ten Points won't look anything like this. It'll have changed into some free lunch program for the powerful interest groups. You'll have to swear that you won't allow any amendments at all. Can you do that? Can you really mean that? Huey, I not only can, but I will. Nothing I've said in my speeches has contradicted any of these points. Most of them are just mechanical things anyway, like having the money exist only in computer accounts. Okay, Prescott. I just wanted to be sure you understood, because this is what we'd like to do. We want to tell the folks that this is the bill we'll work to get passed. We want to give copies of this bill to everyone at the meeting tonight and to the news media and put it on our website. We want to make this bill the centerpiece of the remainder of the campaign. You understand what that means, don't you, Prescott? Yes, Huey, I do understand what it means. But I was and am already committed heart and soul to this new money. Do you understand, Huey? My soul is committed to this bill because I know this bill is God's will. If I were to fail, well, it would damn me forever. Huey, absolutely nothing in this world can make me go back on getting this bill passed. I don't care if it's the only thing I ever accomplish in what remains of my life. All right, sir, because if we do this and the bill is not passed, or we accept any amendments to this bill, it would be the absolute end of any chance for election to any office ever again. There'll be hundreds of copies of your pledge in this bill. Any deviation will make wonderful campaign ads for any opponent you might have. We live or die with this bill. Huey, I'm an old man. I haven't got long before I go before God to account for my life on this earth. Do you really think I care about any election when I have that in my immediate future? His hand on Huey's shoulder pressed with an almost painful force, and Frobisher's eyes burned into Huey's eyes as if lit from within. Huey had a moment of almost awe as he looked at Frobisher. He began to understand why the crowds at Frobisher's speeches were so enthusiastic. The man simply was conviction itself. His personality, which had been nothing in particular a month ago, 
had become suffused with passionate determination. He was confident and self-assured. There was no hesitation in speech nor shifting of eyes as he looked at you. I couldn't stop him now if I wanted to, Ed, you would recounted later. He could go on that stage at the stadium tonight and blow that audience away without your speech or my pep talk or any of the fanfare. But he does have my speech, and you will give an opening warm-up pep talk to the crowd, and there will be fanfare and fireworks. That crowd and even the television audience will be blown away. Boss, we're going to be in the big leagues after tonight. That star is going to pull our wagon just as far as we let it. Right, Ed. But stars are really hot, and they do burn those who get too close, and they do explode when they get old like Frobisher. Stars are dangerous, Ed, and those who commit to stars often suffer for it. Clark's room, Tuesday night, about 11 o'clock, after the stadium show. Clark's phone rang for the fourth time in ten minutes, and Clark finally looked at it. It was from home. The question is, he thought, is that Mama or Buddy? I don't think I could face Buddy, but I would really like to talk to Mama. Finally, he decided to take the risk and answered. Hello? Clark, are you all right? All was well. It was Mama. I'm fine, Mama. Just tired. It's been a big night. Yes, we saw it on TV. They broadcast it on CNN. We got to see most of the rally. Oh, Clark, I am so proud of you. They seem to love your idea. Mama, they just love the idea of free things. We're just promising them what they want. But, Clark, you aren't lying to them, are you? Well, not really, Mama. You remember that we're saying we can do this, referring to everybody in the country? That's true, isn't it? We do produce enough food and housing and so forth that everybody could have what they need. It's something that we can do. Then Clark's dad took the phone. Boy, what's this, what is this bull you're peddling down there? I got to look at that bill you guys are putting up. That's a pile of foolishness. It's crazy. Who do you think is going to pay for all that free stuff? I ain't going to pay for it. You can bet on that. I didn't send you down there to go communist on me. What kind of kooks are in charge down there? I thought Frobisher was right wing. The stuff he's peddling is pure socialism. Free to all that is needed is right out of that communist manifesto by Karl Marx. That communist who was shown to be idiocy back when Russia fell apart 20 years ago. And here you go trying to sell the same garbage all over again. I got a mind to go down there and pull you out by the scruff of your neck and paddle your behind all the way back home. You got no more sense than a sack of feathers. Let alone, let, let me alone, honey, I know what I'm doing. Dad, there is nothing communist or socialist about this bill at all. Read it again. There is nothing in there about government controlling anything. It's all rewards, Dad. There's no jail or fine squads or dictatorship in it at all. It's right out of the communist manual, you dumb kid. Nobody is going to pay to feed those shiftless, no-account, lazy, good for nothing bums unless somebody is holding a gun on them. That's all socialism is, boy. It's the government holding guns on businessmen to force them to feed people who don't work. It's stealing from the rich to give to the lazy. It happened in Rome, and it happened in Russia and China, and they all went down. It's not like that. Don't you tell me what it is and isn't, boy. I read the bill. Now you get your fat, lazy self on a plane and come home, or I'm cutting your allowance off right now. Dad, I'm not coming home. I have a job in this campaign, and I'm seeing it through. I live in a box rather than quit now. Then you'll have to live in a box because you've got no home to come back to. Buddy, no, please, you can't. Click. Clark was trembling with fear, anger, determination, and outrage. He'd gotten a lot of congratulations from Huey and even Frobisher, in addition to the rest of the staff. Why, Frobisher himself had taken Clark's hand in his powerful practiced grip, looked Clark deeply and sincerely in the eyes and said, My boy, you are a godsend to this campaign and to the American people. I will never forget what you have done for me, and more important, for the people of this state and nation. I am eternally in your debt. Clark had felt the power of Frobisher's newfound charisma, and had felt that Frobisher had meant what he had said. Doris was as proud of him as a mother could be, and he was getting respect from men twice his age. There was no way that he could give this up now and return home like a whipped puppy with his tail between his legs. He would send some letters home to Mama and reassure her that he was all right. His father was no doubt raging at his mother, and there was nothing he could do about that. He had practically been disowned. He needed sleep, but his mind was still racing with what he had experienced at the football stadium. The night had been successful on a scale that he could hardly believe. The crowd had been on from the beginning, and Huey's warm-up had hardly been necessary. Prescott had started with the usual points from the stump speeches, but had soon built up the we-can-do-this message to a peak, 
and then said, with fireworks exploding overhead, and this is how. It seemed like the air was filled with sheets of paper, each with a bill printed on it. Each of the ten points was numbered, and Prescott quickly read through them. After each, he said, just like that, word for word, no changes. And he said what the point would do for the people. This means that no one can steal your money. This means prices will never change. This means no unemployment ever again. This means no taxes of any kind for anybody ever. With each point, the cheers grew louder, especially the free necessities point. When he finished with the tenth point and said, Any of you can have this power. The crowd again cheered lustily, raising their arms to Frobisher on the stage. And Clark was thinking, Why can't people see how silly it is? Tonight's rally should result in the crowd turning on Frobisher and ridiculing him. They should be laughing at the whole idea. This was supposed to be Clark's big moment when Hugh and the others were shown up like the people in the Emperor's New Clothes fairy tale. Clark thought, They seem to think these sheets of paper are magic or something. Well, maybe they are magic in some way. One of them turned Dad into an idiot, and right in front of Mama, too. There isn't anything socialist about the new money. It's just silly, that's all. I mean, the ten points don't even talk about government powers or anything like that. They don't mention anything about enforcement, even. They don't say anything about what anybody has to do. That's just an ignorant redneck, that's all. Of course, Huey and Frobisher are really rednecks, too, and they seem to understand right off that there's nothing socialist about this idea. On the stage at that point, Frobisher reached into his coat and brought out his Bible. The crowd, which had been so loud... Invisible Hand, Chapter 5, Fast Food, in which Neil finds out that there is such a thing as a free meal, and Tony tells something of his past. As they shuffled out of the apartment, the kids pulling Neil between them, he noticed that they didn't lock the door. Are you leaving the apartment unlocked on purpose? What's the point in locking it, Tony said. Nobody's home. Neil was surprised at Tony's casual attitude. Well, um, well, for starters, they could rob us blind while we're away. You may not have anything worth stealing, but I have some things I'd rather not lose, Neil said. Wordlessly, Tony walked back into the apartment. Brianna said, I hope he can find the key. Normally we never lock up when we go out. She looked at her father as though he were a stranger, which in a sense he was, still getting used to the idea that here he was. You see, she continued, there haven't been any thefts in this building in the time we've been here, what, four years? The computer would record anyone stealing something. Neil got the uneasy feeling back in his stomach as he glanced at the opaque rectangle of the TV. And there really isn't much here to steal anyway. At least I can do something about that with all this money. Does the computer watch the hallway all the time? Neil asked, absentmindedly resisting the bilateral tugging that he was enduring from John and Laura. Sure, Brianna explained. That way, if one of the kids goes out without telling me, the computer lets me know and tells me what they're doing. Adding... It's funny, but I don't think of it as a computer. Computer, If you follow me, it's just kind of there, something you get used to pretty soon. Anyhow, Johnny can go to the playground if he wants to, and Laura can go next door to play with her friends. It, the computer, can't take care of them, but it can tell me where they are and what they're doing. The last bit of Brianna's explanation tailed away from Neil's notice, as in his mind the apartment building began to resemble a prison. It was, he understood, a flashback of the kind Darren had said would occur frequently as he became more acculturated, but unpleasant nonetheless. The cheerful decorations were transformed in his mind to camouflage for something sinister. Malevolent forces kept them under observation 24 hours a day. Even the playground was no haven. Thank God his captors had not had this technology, or he'd still be cooling his mouth with wet pebbles. He had to get his family out of the country. Mom, can we go ahead and let Dad come later? Johnny asked, shattering Neil's uncomfortable reverie. No, you can't, big guy, said Tony, coming through the door. Key held up for all to see, as if it were a trophy or some oddity. Sorry for the delay, Neil. We just don't use it that much, he said. No problem, Neil said. Brianna's been filling me in. It looks like there's a lot I need to fill in. They'd told him that, and he intellectually realized that you don't just drop out of a society, return 12 or 15 years later, and pick up where you left off. And, oh, yes, throw in a bizarre change in the entire concept of money, and there you go. But it was different actually going through it rather than hearing about it. Become accustomed to being very careful not to touch or otherwise disturb anyone else's property. Nowadays, everybody just sort of assumes that no one would touch their stuff, Tony finished. I understand that the more modern apartment buildings have palm plates and voice recognition, Brianna added. It'll probably be years before it's in the older buildings like this, though. Yeah, not only that, thought Neil. 
but I'll bet they even have electric locks on the doors so you can't get out without permission either. The walk was pleasant, the weather moderate, and the sunset had everyone, well, almost everyone, in a relaxed mood. Even Neil had perked up once they had gained the sidewalk, out of the building and away from his morose thoughts of surveillance. They moved toward the restaurant, a small knot of family with Neil seeming to be swept along, a kid on each side and an adult front and rear, on a tide of non-stop conversation and banter. "'It's in England, dopey!' Johnny charitably said to his sister as they were crossing the street to the brightly lighted building that was their destination. "'Mom! Dad! Tell stupid head that I know where Granddad is from!' wailed Laura, who had only the faintest idea where in the world London was, but wouldn't admit it for all the string liquors her brother would ever get. "'Laura! Johnny! How about we just be happy that he's here with us now in Virginia? There's no argument about that, is there?' Tony said, only slightly breaking stride during the sibling sniping. On the way, Brianna and Tony had the chance to introduce Neil to several of the people they encountered, folks like themselves out to enjoy a nice walk on a pleasant evening. Still, it seemed to Neil that there were a good number more people walking around than he could remember, or thought he could remember. He had to remind himself. One of Darren's caveats had been about the good old days. Neil could safely count on their being old, but the good is often what Darren called a nostalgia halo, where the good we remember is better than it had been, and the bad less so. Most of the acquaintances seemed to be wearing some variation of white outfits, but always accessorized with something that looked more expensive than the outfits themselves. Neil had all the fashion sense of a blind chameleon, but this stood out even to him. For instance, one older gentleman, Tony had introduced as Sidney, carried a cane with what looked like a sterling silver handle. Several ladies had pins or brooches or bracelets in varying sizes. Some seemed to be croissant, while others looked like gold and white gold or platinum. Brianna herself was wearing a belt with a perfect turquoise oval dominating the buckle. It took Neil only a moment to recognize it as a gift he had sent her from Texas. Neil's own clothes, he was still in his gray suit, while not expensive at all, were clearly not some variation of the whites he saw on many of the other adults. All the children Neil saw were dressed rather colorfully. Everything seemed to fit without the spill out or dragging jean cuffs Neil remembered. Some of them were playing with toys that looked expensive, elaborate electronic whatsis with remote controllers, dolls that were articulate in speech as well as movement, solidly built wagons of bright yellows, blues, and, of course, red. One woman pushed an elaborate two-seat stroller down the block with two colorfully dressed babies curiously staring at the world, yet her own clothes were whites. "'What's with all this white clothing? Is it a fashion thing?' Neil asked. "'Dad, we don't usually refer to it, but plain white clothing is what we call standard clothing.' Brianna had lowered her voice so as not to be overheard by the others they passed on the sidewalk. That's clothing one doesn't have to pay for. Most people use it for outside work or for manual labor, but this is a poor neighborhood, so most people save their money for other luxuries like I do and wear mostly standard clothes at home and for just hanging around the neighborhood. It isn't polite to refer to it, and almost everyone but payers will wear something that isn't standard just to show that they could be wearing colors if they wanted to. Payers? Why do they wear white clothes? Payers are the people who can credit your account with more money. They can't have money or things money can buy for themselves, so they're left with only standard or free clothes to wear, while, and they're all white. If somebody is wearing all white clothes and not seeming to work at anything, they're probably a payer, Tony answered. But what about the children? They've got lots of colors. Do the parents all spend their money on luxury clothes for the kids? Standard clothing for children has just always been colorful. I don't know why. In fact, other than Halloween costumes or suits, I can't remember ever seeing any luxury clothes for children. I guess they make some, but... Oh, hi, June. This is my dad. He just got back in the country and dropped in to visit for a few days. The good and quick was a familiar sight to Neil, at least in architecture and layout. Much was unchanged except for there being more booths and fewer individual or two-seater tables than he recalled. He understood why Bree had called this place family-friendly, or whatever she'd said. This one also boasted a large indoor play area with lots of soft plastic toys and things to climb on. The play area was situated at the front of the restaurant, opening to the street, and was excellent advertising for the customers they seemed to want to attract. The lighted picture menu over the counter had fewer hamburgers than he remembered. More salads, baked potatoes, and vegetables took their place. The accompanying pictures looked a bit odd in the company of the Mega Burger and Fearless Fries. The children's menu seemed as elaborate as an adult menu and, again, with a surprising emphasis on vegetables and salads. The two inescapable soft drink brand names were predictably present, but several fruit drinks and milk clearly had more space on the menu. Oh, and there were no prices anywhere that he could see. Again with the money, he thought. Where are the prices? Neil whispered to Brianna. 
There aren't any. This is a standard food place, she whispered back, gently rocking Laura by her shoulders as they waited their turn for service. They hadn't long to wait because the people in front of them ordered with the efficiency and confidence of long-time regulars. Neil noticed that their selections came across the hot table on actual ceramic plates, rather thick and plain, but ceramic, or earthenware, nonetheless. And again, not one word about prices. Neil followed the lead of the others in ordering. Brianna recommended a vegetable plate if he weren't very hungry. The kids knew the menu without looking. One of the servers, Diane, was by her nameplate, who looked to be in her junior or senior year of high school, noticed the family and asked Laura whether she'd lost that loose tooth yet. Laura opened her mouth wide, then obscured the view by pointing with her finger to the place where the tooth had been, following that by pressing the tip of her tongue in the space, giving her an endearing but slightly goony look. "'Well, I think that calls for a special treat tonight,' Diane said. "'How about a scoop of ice cream after dinner? Would that be all right with Mommy?' "'Yes, oh yes, Mommy, would that be all right, won't it?' Ex Laura excitedly agreed, as if it were one long word she was pronouncing. Bree smiled thankfully at Diane and came out with, "'If we finish dinner, right, darling?' Neil wondered if the, that line were somehow from a sleeper gene was activated when people achieved parenthood. If ice cream were that much of a treat, then she'd obviously didn't get it very often, Neil reflected. He'd begun to notice that he was seeing things in their darkest possible light or negative sense or something, and he couldn't understand why. Darren had told him, caveat number 256, that he wouldn't know how he was going to react to people, events, and things seemingly unrelated to his experience, as he obviously had never been through this type of reentry into his society. Open mind, open eyes, had been how Darren summed it up. Check out everything, and don't be too quick to draw conclusions. He seemed to be a bit quick on the draw here in a few hours since he'd landed in Washington. That was depressing to Neil, who had always taken pride in his mental abilities. Laura happily led her mother to her favorite booth, bright blue vinyl and formica right in front of the play area. The rest of the family joined them shortly, with John on his best behavior, figuring it was not out of the question for him to get ice cream, too, if he played these cards correctly. Neil was surprised with the quality of the food. He complimented Brianna on her suggesting the place and commented that he had paid dearly in London for food not this good, and not in a chain family restaurant either, for that matter. Brianna explained that there were a lot of other standard food places in the area since the apartments weren't luxury ones, and of course that meant that to keep their customers, the restaurants had to make the food and service good. They can't compete on prices or location, so they have to try to excel in other ways. I especially like the head cook they have here now. The amount of business they do here at least doubled since they got her. Mary, I don't remember her last name. Anyway, she came here directly from cooking school about 18 months ago, Brianna said, and added somewhat wistfully, I don't know how long they can keep her here if some of the luxury places find out about her. She'll be getting offers from all over town. One thing's sure, she half laughed. We're careful who we tell. She's that good. The kids asked if they could join some of their friends in the play area. With the usual warnings and subsequent eye-rolling, permission was granted, and off they ran. One of the women, sitting at another table, got up and followed them, and sat on one of the adult-sized chairs near the door to the play area where she had a good view of the children. Neil, a little worried by such behavior, asked about her. "'Oh, that's Mrs. Peters,' answered Tony, allowing Bree a few bites of her dinner. "'She likes to watch the kids play, and this way she can get paid for it, too. "'What do you pay her?' to Tony, and to himself. "'God, does anyone cross the street around here without getting paid for it?' And we used to have God's name on money. We don't pay her anything. We thank her, of course, but that's just common courtesy for her kindness. The payers pay her, same as they pay everyone else. It isn't much, but as I say, she enjoys doing it anyway. She knows all the kids on the street and never has any trouble getting one to run errands for her or make minor repairs around her apartment. So there's your quid pro quo, I guess. Do you ever use her as a babysitter? No, she doesn't like to be tied down that way. Here she can get up and leave any time she feels like it, whereas if she were babysitting at our, at our apartment, you know, she'd have to stay until we got back. Besides, if we need a sitter, we can just take the kids across the street to the baby farm. Brianna joined in an, an expectant look in her eye as she addressed her dad. Baby farm? Neil said, feeling the color drain from his face. Whoa, that's just what we call it, Dad, said Brianna, who got more of a reaction than she'd figured on. Mr. Jurgens runs it. Half the kids in the neighborhood must have worked there at one time or another, she noted. He lives upstairs over the business, so you can get him 7 by 24 whenever you need someone to look after the kids. When he goes on vacation, he has someone live in his apartment, so they can take over. You mean you could leave Laura and John with him and come back and find them with some stranger? Neil said, his face beginning to recolor. If this kept up, he'd look like a schizoid thermometer. No, Dad, not a stranger. People he's known for years. I guess I really should call him Dr. Jurgen, since he was a pediatrician at one time. 
He said he quit as a doctor because he could prevent more problems than he could cure. You know, he even has dentists come in every month or so to look at the kids' teeth, and all the new mothers go to him for advice. Tony said jokingly, Oh, you just like him because he said you were doing a great job with John and Laura. Jurgen's baby farm was all Neil could think of as he watched a group of four teens clamor through the door. Hey, Julian, got anything for us? asked the one in the lead, about sixteen, skinny, and so far losing the war with acne vulgaris. Big do at the school next month, and we need some money, fast, another yelled to one of the older servers. Oh, yeah, I can use a couple of you fellows tomorrow morning, about 4 a.m. Uh, make that 4 a.m. sharp, he continued, a charitable file, smile on his face. You can help with a clean-up and breakfast prep. The teens groaned, then they turned to the people who were eating. Anyone got any work that needs doing? We're getting desperate. Good blood, one of the diners yelled and was rewarded with a respectable laugh. But no one had anything for them to do. They're paying the price for not thinking ahead, Tony said, as they watched the teens argue with Julian about tomorrow morning and then leaving. If they'd started a year ago, or even a couple of months ago, they could have done a lot of things which would have generated a significant amount of money by now. But by waiting until the last minute, well, there aren't that many things one can do that will run a lot of money that quickly, he said, adding, you know, kind of like waiting too long to start those term papers in school. Oh, that reminds me, Tony, could you take John's euro note to the library tomorrow and make a copy for Laura to have? That way she won't be so jealous and she won't be so tempted to steal it. Counterfeiting now, Bree? Tony laughed down at her. Oh, who's going to care if we make a copy? It isn't as if we were ever going to go to Europe and try to spend it. I don't think it would pass anyway because of the paper and the lack of a computer in it, Neil added. Then he continued, When I was a kid, way back last century, in a way he had sworn as a kid that he would never tell stories when he became a grown-up, I could get grunt work, you know, manual labor, for, I don't know, $200 a week, minimum wage. And since I didn't make that much per year, the tax bite wasn't bad, Neil said with a smile, remembering his own do-or-die high school crises. Yes, Tony said, but you got paid by the hour. These days, it's an entirely different standard. You get paid by the net benefit. Benefit? Neil asked. Benefit to whom? Benefit to anyone else, Tony said. And that's net benefit. If you help one but harm another, the two consequences are compared and you get paid for only the amount the help exceeds the harm. Wait a minute. How could anybody ever measure such a thing? And, con and the consequences of every action continue for eternity. You've read about chaos theory and the butterfly effect, haven't you? Neil said, trying to restrain his contempt for the idea. Okay, Neil. So you work hard for a week and the job isn't finished. You don't get anything because the benefit the job will produce hasn't happened yet. And then when it is finished, you start to get paid a month or so later, after the pairs have had a chance to notice some consequences, he continued. Of course, you may keep getting paid for a particular job for years. I still get about $50 a month for when I worked in the boat yard. I guess so long as those ships I help build are sailing, I'll keep getting paid something. You mean it's like royalties except it's on everything people do? Neil asked. I guess you could put it that way, Tony mused, at least in a rough way. But these kids need the money right away, Neil said. Can't they just borrow the money and do some work later, maybe? Well, their parents might pay for some. They might work out something that way. But since you can't actually borrow money itself, you have to get someone to buy something and give it to you. Then later you can buy something for them that costs about the same. It's inconvenient to do, and you can only do it with close friends or relatives who won't tell anyone. It isn't easy. But why the secrecy? Is it illegal? Neil asked, his danger meter fluttering again in his imagination. Oh, it's quite legal. Almost nothing you do with your own property is illegal, so long as it hurts no one, Tony said. But borrowing that way to get luxuries shows a lack of planning and a lack of the ability to defer gratification. People aren't likely to trust you with capital or work with you if they don't think you're reliable. Your reputation for dependability is much more important now than it used to be. What do you mean more important than it used to be, Neil said, warming to the challenge of a good old in my time argument. We valued our reputations plenty in those days. Yes, some people did, Tony replied. But if you moved to another town or lived in a big city, most all the people you dealt with didn't know you, or at least that's the way I imagine it, he said. If you came in some store with a wad of money, no one really cared what kind of person you were. They'd sell you almost anything, and you could buy almost anything. Wouldn't you agree? He asked Neil, who nodded slowly with the wariness of the unconverted. All right, then, the lecture continued. Today you can only buy luxuries. For capital goods, you have to persuade people to give them to you. They get paid based on what you do with those goods. You'd better believe that they want to know as much as they can about you before they'll let you have much. Here, Tony looked at Neil as much in interest at his expression as in a normal conversational pause. The latter looked confused, as if he'd walked into the wrong house by mistake. 
In your day, Tony continued, unconsciously rubbing Neil's nose in the fact that he was getting old, if you wanted to start a business, you'd have to borrow money to buy the capital goods like the lumber and pipes and nails and hammers and such, right? Sure. Well, these days you don't borrow money to buy tools or raw materials. You go directly to the folks who own them and ask them to give them to you. Why in the world would they give them away? Why would someone loan you the money, Tony countered? Because I'll pay it back with interest. Now, why would somebody just up and give me tools? Because they think they'll get paid for doing so. Ha! Brianna was just telling me that I can't give anybody money, so how am I going to pay them for their tools? That's what the payers do. If you use those tools to benefit others, then the payers credit the folks who gave you the tools. The more benefit you produce using them, the more they get paid. In a lot of ways, it's just like that bank loaning you money. The more money you make using the capital you borrowed from the bank, the easier it will be for you to pay them back with interest, and the more likely you are to want to borrow even more money to expand your business. In both cases, the bank in your day and the capitalists in our day, they want to know what you're going to do with what they give you. Would you guys just shut up with the economics? I want to hear what Dad's been doing the last 15 years, Brianna said. Sorry, hon, I just got carried away there. I know you warned me, Tony said, holding up his hands in mock surrender and with a grin. Okay, Brianna, what would you like to know, Neil asked with some reluctance. There were many things he had experienced while abroad, and especially in captivity, that he never wanted her to know about. Well, you know, what have you been doing? Mostly waiting. I spend a lot of time trying to find food and keep clean. You have no idea how difficult it is to get clean when there's hardly any water beyond drinking water and cooking water. The first thing I did when I was released was take a bath that lasted about an hour. I just lay there after I'd scrubbed and savored the feel of being covered in warm water. And the soap, I must have soaped that washcloth five or six times and just kept washing and washing. It was heaven. How did you keep from going crazy, Tony asked with a look of sympathy. I'm not so sure I didn't go crazy for a while there. At first I was just scared and then depressed and finally resigned. I started thinking I would never be released, that they would end up shooting me or that I'd die of disease or starvation. So I went over what I could remember of my life. I tried to remember everything I did as a child and as an adult. I looked for meaning for anything I could think of that would show my life had some value. I looked for things I could feel proud of. I even looked for things I'd done wrong that would mean that I deserved what was happening to me. Some days I thought it was a good thing that it was me it had happened to because I was strong enough to stand up to it. Other times my attitude was pure, why me? And I was upset that a person as good as I was, who had just tried to help other people, had to suffer as I was suffering. Oh, Dad, it must have been awful. Brianna was almost at the point of tears. Conversations at the tables near them were getting quiet. Neil glanced around and spoke in a lower voice and tried to grin as he said, Well, it all worked out all right. I'm here. I'm reasonably healthy. I can carry on a somewhat civilized conversation. And the computer tells me I have lots of money. I hope those people who did this to you died horrible deaths, Brianna said fiercely. Darling, they didn't treat me any worse than most of the other people who were living in that village. They were all hungry most of the time, and none of them had as much water as they would have liked. It's just that I was lucky enough to have plenty of food and plenty of clean water before I was taken. I was only suffering because I'd been spoiled by being so much richer all my previous life. Tony nodded his head and asked, <clears throat> And how long was it before you felt that way? Oh, only about ten years, Neil grinned. Do you still have any problems, you know, like medical problems or whatever? I know what you're asking, Tony. You want to know if I'm crazy or contagious. <laughs> Neil's continuing grin took away much of the sting, but Tony still flushed a little. They tell me that I'm completely dewormed and deloused. They shaved all my hair off first thing when I went to the hospital and put stuff on my sores. See, they're virtually gone now, Neil said, pulling up the sleeve of his suit coat. There were some splotches of pink, but the skin was intact and appeared healthy. As far as my mental health is concerned, they said that I would never completely get over the trauma, but that lots of people live with much worse than what I went through. And I guess they're right. At least I was an adult when I went through it. Brianna couldn't help looking at her children as she, as she realized what Neil meant. They were happily careening from one side of the playroom to another, healthy and active. But they said that given how well I stood up to my captivity, that I was probably more sane than the average person on the street. I don't know whether to find that reassuring or not, Neil chuckled. You seem fine to me, too, sir, Tony said, punching Neil gently on the shoulder. Do you still have any problems from it? Brianna asked. Let's see. I still dream I'm in captivity, At least that, but at least that doesn't itch. I have an impulse to eat some of the weeds I see, but I no longer hoard food, so that's not really a problem. 
Sometimes I have these little flashbacks as if my emotions were still responding to my being in captivity. It's like the soldiers returning from war suddenly diving on the floor at a, a sudden loud sound or crouching because a bird's shadow flashes past. My subconscious still sometimes thinks I'm in Afghanistan. Well, I think you're pretty wonderful to come through something like that as well as you have. I'd have been a basket case, Brianna asserted. And speaking of getting enough to eat, I'm getting us some dessert. She rose and headed toward the sweet section. At least, Tony said, you shouldn't have any trouble getting work. Your record and strength of character makes a good reputation. I doubt there are many who would be unhappy to have you work with them. But I just came to town, Neil pointed out. How am I supposed to have a reputation, good or bad? How could I get a job? How could I get started in a business? He continued, now in a definite role. I have all this money, and you say it wouldn't do me any good since it won't buy a store or merchandise or hire employees or do God only knows what else. Dad, Brianna said, having returned with a slice of cake for each of them, having that money is a great start to getting a good reputation. You aren't likely to get a lot of money without having been successful at something in the past. I mean, because you get paid to generate benefits and you have money, then you must have generated some benefits somewhere, right? She asked, patting his knee. Besides, you're part of our family, and we have a pretty good reputation in some circles, she added, smiling. How will some employer know me from Adam's house cat? Neil asked. Your reputation and references, Tony said. Oh, incidentally, we don't call people employers anymore. It's not as if some owner were paying you to work with him. You don't need his permission to do something to benefit someone else. If he owns the capital you use, then he's one of your suppliers, he said, looking closely at the large slice of cake on his plate. Take when I worked in the shipyard, for example. Oh, no, here comes the I worked with my hands bit again. Brianna rolled her eyes, but the mischievous grin took away the insult. <clears throat> As I was saying, Tony resumed, blatantly looking down his nose at his wife, I drove a forklift. I didn't own it when I first came to work there, of course. What happened was they ran three shifts, and the three of us who operated that machine would each give it to the guy on the next shift when our shift was done, and so on, 24 hours a day. The guy I replaced spent a week teaching me how to use it before he left. If I hadn't been pretty good at it by the time he finished that week of training me, then they wouldn't have given it to me. They would have tried to find someone else who could do it better, because if I messed up, it hurt their pay too. Anyway, I never got real good with it, but I was careful and kept it clean and maintained, and all that got me through. I also trained my replacement when the time came for me to move along. Brianna made a grab for what was left of Tony's cake, which was almost untouched since he'd been talking. He fended her off, and she stuck her tongue out at him. Neil was incredulous. It was like communism or socialism or one of those horrible isms of his youth. You mean you actually owned the forklift for just eight hours each workday? That's crazy. Not crazy at all, if you don't mind my contradicting you, said Tony with a grin. When I'm in the driver's seat on that forklift, what that machine does is up to me and me alone. I control that machine. I gassed it up and kept it clean. It was, as far as I was concerned, my forklift. Tony paused to slide his dessert plate back closer to himself, casually bringing it to the side away from Bree. Now, if you're talking about who has the title of that forklift, then I guess that would be somebody at the company that made it. You know, that's interesting. I never thought about it before, but I had no idea who had title to that forklift. You're lecturing, and if I catch you at it again, I'm going to dump whatever's left of your dessert in your lap, even if Julian does get mad at me for it, Brianna announced in her best parent the child admonition voice. But Brianna, I need to know about this reputation thing if I ever hope to get a job again, Neil said. Tony promptly stuck his tongue out at Brianna, who slapped his arm. Who keeps those records, and how do, they, how do you find out about someone else's reputation? I can't tell you because my wife forbids it. She'll have to tell. And Tony placed his arm on the table around his plate of cake and began wielding his fork with the other hand. They're all in the computer, so wherever you go, you just ask, Brianna said. So all you have to do is ask the computer, Neil said with a twisted smile. Aha, he thought to himself. Well, not quite, Brianna said. You have to get the person's permission for the computer to tell you the information it has about them. And even then, the permission only applies to their past and is only the part related to their past work. The other stuff the computer knows about you, as they say, isn't for public consumption. But <clears throat> what's in this reputation? Is it only job stuff? No, I guess it includes about everything. Neil's cold chills were coming back. Funny how you could be scared even in a bright, cheery place among happy people with the smell of good food in the air. I mean, the computer must have all sorts of information about everybody in its records, but it only tells other people what's appropriate, you know? Neil didn't know. He didn't know at all. What about your personal history? What about the people who know you? Do they get to gossip about you? 
Neil was thinking in particular about Mrs. Smithers, the Heridian living next door to Catherine and him when they first married and were in their paper-walled row house. He swore the old bat did nothing but wait to put the ear to the wall when they were home and then give them the moon eye whenever they saw her sitting there poured into her rickety chair on the tiny porch from which she monitored the street. Well, the computer does hear some gossip from time to time, of course, Brianna said, looking over Neil's shoulder. The kids are getting a little tired, honey. We might think about going home, she said to Tony. And then again to Neil, she added, I've been asked about a few of my friends. I always tried to give an accurate picture of what they were like, but, you know, gossip is just that, and, and any coordinator worth her salt isn't going to give much weight to really weird stuff. I mean, it would be documented somewhere if it were true, right? Well, yeah, okay, good point, Neil answered. Coordinator, he wondered. That's another new one, like a payer. Ice cream! Is it time for ice cream yet, Mommy? Laura had come running from her play, having remembered the promised treat. Yes, it's time, but you get your ice cream in a cone instead of in a bowl this time, so you can eat it while we walk home. After a brief pause, having seen John's face with its eyebrows raised in its big smile, All right, John, you too. John was almost able to beat his sister to the counter, where the nice lady took their orders with a big smile and handed each a cone. Brianna, Neil said, how can I find out what the computer has on me? Just ask it. If you don't want anyone else to hear, be sure you're alone. I mean, the computer's pretty good about keeping its voice hard to understand when you're in a public place, but if you're in a group and everyone is obviously paying attention, the computer will usually just talk in a normal voice since it assumes you don't mind. Of course, there are some things, like medical information, that it won't talk about with others there unless you say it's okay to tell them. So, if my work history is okay, all I have to do is tell the computer to let my prospective employer see it and I can get a job? May I, dear? Tony asked with a grin. Brianna nodded, but punched him in the ribs to make sure he realized who was really boss. It's really more that if you don't let them see your reputation, they won't be willing to work with you. Brianna forestalled another lecture by saying, Let's go. The kids have got their ice cream. Tony, will you watch Laura to be sure she doesn't drop it like last time? You remember what a fuss we had over that one. Then, with Tony diplomatically quieted, she linked her arm with her father's arm and followed her husband and children out the door to the street. Do you want to get a job already, Dad? she asked. I'll go crazy if I don't have something to do. I can't just sit around all day and do nothing. I might as well be back in Afghanistan. But you're here now. You can do whatever you want to do here. I wish, thought Neil. I can do whatever the computer lets me. That's really subtle to control who can get what job by slanting the victim's work history so he can get only the job the computer wants him to have. I bet most people don't even realize what's being done to them. The more I see of this, the more frightening it is. Most of these white sheep I see on the street here probably don't even realize they're being manipulated. But somebody's doing the shearing. You can count on that. All in all, it had been a good meal, for all the price weirdness, and Tony had laid down quite a bit for Neil to consider. The credentials he had when he left the country wouldn't be worth as much now, he realized, unless he threw his life into the hopper of this computer, a prospect he didn't relish and distrusted even more. What had he come home to, anyway? Thank you for attending today's presentation of Invisible Hand by Larry K. Mason, brought to you by GayTalkRadio.org and QueerPublicRadio.com. We hope you will join us tomorrow as the story continues at 9 p.m. Eastern Time and 6 p.m. Pacific Time. In case you've missed any of the episodes, you may listen to them by visiting QueerPublicRadio.com or by visiting Mr. Mason's website at www.NoPalm.info. That's www.NoPalm.info. Thank you for joining us. And as always, we wish you the best to you and yours.